Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It is Monday, May 22nd, 2023, and I'm going to call this City Council meeting for the City of Bloomington to order. Uh, we will start our meeting as we always do. If you would, please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Once again, thanks to everybody who's joining us here in the chambers and everybody watching online tonight. Uh, gorgeous spring evening, so I appreciate you being here inside with us uh, on 80 degrees and sunny still at 6.30 in the evening. Our first item of, agen on, uh, of, uh, of note tonight is approval of the agenda. Our agenda includes a total of three introductory items. We're going to have an introduction of new employees and then two proclamations, one for Public Works Week and another proclamation regarding Memorial Day. Item three, our consent business. Councilmember Carter has consent this evening, and we have 15 items on the consent agenda this evening. Under item four, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, we have four items. Uh, our first two public hearings, the first being a vacation of public drainage, uh, utility, sidewalk, etc., and the second, item 4.2, is a public hearing on a proposed license and permit fee changes. Those should be short ones. And item 4.3, a public hearing regarding the city code amendments and our comprehensive plan text amendment with the single and two-family residential standards, which we've covered before and we'll uh, be wrapping up tonight, hopefully. And then item 4.4 is a public hearing, uh, again, comp plan amendment in response to a 2022 system statement issued by the Metropolitan Council. Under organizational business, item 5.1 is a consideration of a solid waste rate study that the council has been talking about, about how we could perhaps adjust our rates to encourage more usage of uh, our organics and recycling and uh, plain recycling programs that we have here in the city of Bloomington. Item 5.2 is a legislative update by Mike Sable. Uh, Mr. Sable, it, it'll be changing right up until the minute you get it. You give the, uh, the, the legislative update, I think, so we'll see how that goes. Looking forward to that. And then we'll finish the evening with item 5.3, our city council policy and issue update. Council, any questions or changes? Council Member Lohman. Uh, Mayor, I just wanted to ask the question uh, if we wanted to rearrange anything uh, today. We looked at uh, a couple of things, possible rearranging, uh, especially moving item 4.3, because I think that's going to have the most, uh, most interest, whether we move it up or move it back. And I'm not sure, you know, I, I know it, moving it up satisfies one group, moving it back satisfies another. Uh, my inclination right now is to leave the, the, the agenda as we are at and kind of work through it as quickly as we possibly can, and click, as quickly as and efficiently as we possibly can. That makes good sense. I just wanted to ask the question because I know sometimes when we have uh, things on the agenda, we want to uh, have that conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Council, any other discussion on this? If not, I will move approval of tonight's agenda. Second. Got a motion and a second by Councilmember Lohman to approve tonight's agenda. No further discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0 and we have an agenda. Our first item tonight is item 2.1, introduction of new employees. We do this fairly regularly now, and I think it's uh, something, a very good thing that we do here at our, our council meetings, an opportunity to meet the new employees here for the city of Bloomington, get their, uh, have them say hello to the council, but also uh, make sure that people watching at home or here in the chambers get to see uh, new employees, and if they recognize them then out in the community at some point, they'll have a chance to stop and say hello. So we've got uh, four new employees that we're going to be talking to tonight. Uh, first, let's start with our folks from Community Services. I think I saw Diane. There's Diane. Very good. Good evening, Ms. Chambers. Welcome. Right. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I am pleased to introduce to you tonight two new members of the Community Services Department, and we will start with Amna Abdullahi, who is a new public health specialist dash assessment quality and accreditation planner. Uh, Amna Abdullahi came to the city of Bloomington from Boynton Health, where she served as a patient assistant and public health communication associate. Her responsibilities included working with patients and clinic staff to ensure quality care, patient safety, and satisfaction. She was also part of the clinic's urgent care work group and diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Amna graduated from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health with a master's in public health administration and policy. She is passionate, she tells us, about all things public health. She's told us that she's really excited to join our population health and planning team and be part of the continuous work and effort to enact lasting change in our communities. Please welcome Amna Abdullahi. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
All right. And then I'm also pleased to uh, have you uh, meet Todd Jensen, who is a new mail coordinator for the city. Todd Jensen joined the city of Bloomington as a mail coordinator on February 6th. After several years previously as a mail carrier, Todd served as, as in Port Edwards, Wisconsin, as postmaster for 24 years. While there, he made a career of collecting, sorting, and delivering mail while providing a safe, clean, and functional environment at the town's post office. He followed up that position with six years running a mailroom for, for a Minneapolis law firm with more than 400 employees. Todd is friendly and knowledgeable and has made quick work of learning how our city mailroom operates. Please welcome Todd Jensen. Welcome, welcome Todd. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Hi. Welcome to both of you. Thanks very much for being with us this evening. Thanks for taking the time to come here and say hello and uh, welcome aboard to the city of Bloomington. We're very glad to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have uh, two new employees in our Public Works Department, and I see Mr. Keel coming forward to make the introductions. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Council, it's a pleasure to, to introduce two new employees we have in Public Works, uh, both in our Maintenance Division, and I'll start with Christia. Christia Davern comes to us with uh, over 20 years of experience in facilities management, and she's our new facilities uh, super, or assistant superintendent. Um, most of her time was spent at the University of Minnesota. Uh, most recently, she was uh, in charge of East Cliff, which is the home of the, of the uh, president of the university, and I think of the governor for, for about a half a year coming up here as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she has a Bachelor of Arts and Certificate in Construction Management, uh, both from the University of Minnesota. And while she grew up in, in Edina, she does have a lot of connections to, to Bloomington. Uh, her first two jobs were here in Bloomington, one at Highland, Hills, and then also at the Mall of America. Mm -hmm. uh, and her mom was the, the principal harpist uh, for the Bloomington Symphony until just recently. Um, when not at work, uh, Christia loves uh, downhill skiing and biking, uh, and she's also an avid knitter. So, Christia. Yeah. Good evening, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here in Bloomington. Um, I'm excited to be part of the facilities team and um, I believe buildings should work for the people who are in them, and I'm looking forward to making the buildings in the city work for everyone. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so our second person is, uh, is Tim Barrett, and Tim is our new maintenance superintendent. Um, so Tim comes to us with over 25 years of public works experience, most recently with the city of uh, Northfield as their street and park manager. But Tim is really not new to Bloomington. He, but the bulk of his experience was actually in Bloomington Public Works. He has uh, almost 20 years or over 20 years of experience uh, working as an operator in our maintenance division. Um, so he has, has a degree in finance from St. Cloud State and also a degree in civil engineering from the University of Minnesota. So he's a hard, hard working guy, worked hard here, worked hard going to school at, at night for those two degrees. Uh, he loves to do projects around the house, from finishing his basement to a three-season porch. Um, plays golf when he's able, and he's also a paid on-call firefighter with the city of Rosemont, has been for 15 years. So we'd like to welcome Tim back to our ranks. Good evening, Tim. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, it's great to be back here at Bloomington. It's a great organization, and I'm looking forward to working with um, all the great co-workers that I've uh, had future previous uh, working relationships with and new ones as well. So I'm um, looking forward to giving a great service to the residents and visitors of Bloomington here. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much for being with us this evening and you're joining a, a, a great department, great department. So welcome aboard, glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. The next two items on our agenda are proclamations. So I'm gonna come down to the podium. Every single time, every single time. Well, this ties uh, nicely with our last introduction and uh, ties very nicely with the celebration that we had here at uh, Civic Plaza over the weekend. Uh, item 2.2 is a proclamation for Public Works Week. And I'll read the proclamation and then we can talk a bit about Public Works and uh, our Public Works Open House. So proclamation, Public Works Week. 
May 21st through the 27th, 2023. Whereas public works services provided in our community are an integral part of residents' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs, such as water, sewers, streets and highways, park maintenance, public buildings, solid waste collection, and snow removal. And whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitudes and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim the week of May 21st through the 27th, 2023, as Public Works Week in the City of Bloomington, and I call upon all residents and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Dated this 22nd day of May 2023. I uh, couldn't agree more with the, uh, the importance of educating and informing and welcoming in folks to show them exactly what Public Works does. And on Saturday, we had a Public Works open house, and I don't know how many folks were there, but it was a lot. I know you went through a lot of popcorn, a lot of, uh, a lot of hot dogs. The, uh, the line of kids waiting to ride uh, in the, the vehicles and the trucks, I literally thought their heads were going to explode. They were so excited. And it was just such a wonderful community event. And uh, it, does, it did so much of what, we've, what I just read about here, trying to take away the, 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 um, the misunderstandings, the lack of knowledge, the secrecy of what happens within public works. These are good folks doing good, hard work within the city, the work that we need. They plow the streets, make sure the water turns on and off. They take care of our parks. Uh, do all kinds of maintenance around our facilities. They're just, uh, they're the backbone of the work that we do here in the city of Bloomington. So very proud to uh, make this proclamation for Public Works Week. Congratulations to uh, our Public Works folks uh, for a very successful Public Works open house. And thank you very much for the work that you do for the city of Bloomington. Well done. Thank you so much. Our second proclamation is uh, regarding Memorial Day, which is coming up on May 29th. Memorial Day, uh, Proclamation Memorial Day, May 29th, 2023. Whereas on Monday, May 29th, 2023, Americans in communities across the nation will observe a day of remembrance for the fallen heroes of our armed forces. And whereas the tradition of Memorial Day dates back to 1868, when John, General John A. Logan called for a nationwide day of remembrance to pay tribute to those who gave their lives by serving our country. And whereas Memorial Day was first observed on May 30th, 1868, when flowers were placed at the graves of soldiers buried at Arlington National Cemetery. And whereas this simple act of remembrance has evolved over time into a nationwide tribute of respect for the heroism and patriotism of this nation's fallen, hero, fallen soldiers on the last Monday of May, now known as Memorial Day. And whereas during the week of May, Memorial Day 2023, prisoners of war missing in action flags will be flown at Bloomington Civic Plaza and the Public Works Building, as a reminder of our soldiers who have not returned, and to symbolize the courage and sacrifice that the members of our armed forces have given on behalf of this nation. Now, therefore, I, Tim Bussey, Mayor of the City of Bloomington, do hereby proclaim Monday, May 29th, 2023, as Memorial Day in Bloomington, and I urge all residents to remember and honor those who have died in the service of the United States of America so that their sacrifices will not be in vain. Dated this 22nd day of May, 2023. Now, obviously, uh, me declaring and proclaiming Memorial Day, one way or another doesn't affect it. There's going to be Memorial Day, one way or another. But what I uh, really like doing when we do this is uh, giving us a, an opportunity to pause and think about uh, the folks locally who have served. Uh, we've got in Bloomington Cemetery, we've got a number of veterans, uh, the vast majority who did not die in the service to their country, but served their country and should be remembered in that way. We do have some folks there who actually did die in combat as well. And uh, just a... Uh, it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to thank and remember the folks, uh, our veterans who, who put so much time and effort in, who, um, who serve their country, and who hopefully within the next couple of years, we will be remembering and uh, honoring with a veterans memorial just to our east here on, on the uh, grounds of Civic Plaza as the uh, Bloomington Remembers Veterans Committee is able to construct their, uh, their, memory, their uh, 
memorial on uh, Civic Plaza grounds here in the, in the coming years. So uh, that is our proclamation for Memorial Day, and I uh, hope you all take a moment to enjoy it. Enjoy it as the first weekend of summer, but also take a moment to reflect as to the real reason of Memorial Day as well. Thank you all. We will move on to item three on our agenda, our consent business. Councilmember Carter, you've got the consent agenda. I do, thank you, Mayor. So I have not heard of any holds at this point. Do we have any holds? Last call. Okay, I am not seeing any. So with that, I would move to approve items 3.1 through 3.15. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to accept tonight's consent business. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Councilmember Carter. We will move on to item four, our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And our first public hearing of the evening is item 4.1. And this is a public hearing regarding a vacation of public drainage, utility, sidewalk, bikeway, street, sign, site, egress, and ingress, uh, and all the easements on lots one and two, block one, Winchell's edition, and lot one, block one, Penn Properties edition, Mr. Keel, good evening, again. Yes. Mayor, Council. So this item is related to the redevelopment of the Uropolis site and, and the site immediately to the east of that, and is part of the replatting of that property, which you approved last fall. So the release of these easements is just the first step of the platting. Those, new, those same easements will be rededicated as part of the plat that when it is filed. So rather routine item, uh, we're recommending approval. Thank you, Mr. Keel. Council, any questions of Mr. Keel on this? As he said, rather routine and the first step in, in a process of getting that area redeveloped. No council questions? Very good. This is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing now on item 4.1 regarding uh, the vacation of those many things that I mentioned earlier, and I don't want to repeat again, but uh, we have a public hearing on item 4.1. Anyone in the council chambers wishing to speak to item 4.1 this evening? Matt, do we have anyone on the phone wishing to speak to item 4.1? Mayor, we have no one on the line. Last call for anybody in the chambers. Council, no one in the chambers coming forward, no one on the phone wishing to speak to item 4.1. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.1. So moved. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.1. No further council discussion on this. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Uh, council, any questions, any comments on this? If not, I would look for action on item 4.1. Mayor, I can make that motion. Council Member Martin. I will move that we adopt an ordinance approving the vacation of public drainage, utility, sidewalk, bikeway, street, site, ingress, and egress easements at lots 1 and 2, block 1, Winchell's edition, and lot 1, block 1, Penn Properties edition. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Mua to uh, adopt the ordinance as stated on item 4.1. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much, Mr. Keel. Item 4.2 is our second public hearing of the evening, and this is regarding a proposed license and permit fee changes. And we have our city, cler city clerk, Ms. Christina Scipioni, here this evening. Good evening, Ms. Scipioni. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Give it a moment for the presentation to come up here. Very short presentation to come up. All right, we'll go to our next slide, please. So some quick background for City Council as to why we're here tonight. Um, state law allows for the collection of license permits and fees, which we have in our ordinances, um, in the appendix in our ordinance. Um, fees are based on the city's cost to administer the licenses. Um, so the fee revenue itself goes into our general fund for the most part, and the license administration expenses are then also paid out of that general fund. Um, we found over the year that our fee structure is consistent with comparable cities, um, and most other cities take a kind of annual review process as we do um, to make sure that their fees are staying in line with the cost to administer the licensing and permitting programs. Um, with that said, 
this is the first time I'm up here, and I've worked here for two years now, um, and that is because we did not do any annual review or license fee increases during the COVID um, pandemic, and so we have not increased our license fees since 2019. Uh, we sent out notices to all of our impacted licensees. So we sent out 1,801 uh, letters to our licensees, and we did not receive any feedback from any of our license holders. So the proposed fees for 2023 um, include a, th or a pretty much a 3% increase. Um, we round a little bit so that our license fees stay, you know, kind of on the dollar for most of our license fees. Uh, but it's overall about a 3% increase. Um, and these are kind of our most um, often issued fees that are included in that ordinance amendment. And the full ordinance was in your packet. Next slide, please. So our request tonight um, is to hold the public hearing and then approve the ordinance. And then um, the proposed effective date for the fees would be July 1st of this year. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Scipioni. Appreciate that. And uh, just to, to reiterate again, so this 3% increase covers the cost of administering the licenses. Mayor and Council, that is correct. Um, the majority of that cost is the staff time needed to um, process the licenses and to do any enforcement um, for those license regulations. So, so anytime someone comes forward to look for a tanning license, we're not making money on this. This is simply covering the cost of what it takes to issue that tanning license. Is that correct? That is correct, Mayor and Council. Thank you very much. And I'm surprised to hear we have 1,800 licensees in the city. That, I guess, surprises me a bit. 1,801. 1,801, excuse me. Thank you very much. Council, any questions of Ms. Scipioni? Council Member Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask is, you know, I, over the years, I've seen this process come before us many, many a times. And what I was curious about, you know, in terms of the fee process, my understanding is that's kind of the way that we've done it. We add this 3% uh, uh, on there. Um, one of my questions was uh, whether or not we, other cities have other ways of doing that in order to push forward. You know, so for example, I saw there was a, a license fee for, for child care, um, I think with food, I think it was $500 or something like that, and 530 or something like that. Um, do, do other cities, uh, you know, let's say you have a strategic priority and you decide, you know, we're going to do this in a different way, or is it pretty much this is the way that most cities kind of go about doing this? Uh, Mayor and Council Member Lohman and City Council, um, most cities um, kind of take either two tracks for increasing their license and permits fee, at least what I've seen. There are some cities that do as Bloomington does and kind of do these incremental increases every year. Um, so there isn't kind of a sticker shock for licensees if you make one large change all at once. Um, and then there are some cities that kind of don't do anything for five to seven years and then their license holders receive a much larger increase kind of all at once. Um, that's typically how cities manage it. Um, as far as kind of the Fees for um, for food service. Some of those, remember, are um, are delegated by the Minnesota Department of Health, and so it's hard to have a apples to apples comparison amongst other cities because there are very few cities that have those delegation agreements. Um, but we feel that our fees are in line with and similar to what other cities within the metro region are charging. And then my, my last question to have for you, Mayor, is, uh, you know, recently we just uh, had a process uh, change uh, uh, with, uh, I think, with respect to the cabbies and, and other ways of doing that thing. And it was, you know, basically we brought those uh, changes uh, to being a part of our consent agenda. Well, my question, what prevents us from, because, you know, over the times I've been here, I haven't really seen all that many people uh, come you know, to have conversations about the fees. Is there anything that prevents us from having this under consent agenda? I'm not saying whether or not we should or shouldn't do that, but I just wanted to understand, uh, you know, if we could follow in that same process of looking at maybe there's a different way of doing this. Mayor and Council Member Lohman, City Council, it is definitely something staff is interested in, right? We sent out 1,800 notices. It probably cost the city about $1,400 to do that process, and we received no feedback. Um, now, granted, we haven't held the public hearing yet, um, but staff will be working with research, with legal to research, um, is there a different way we can do this that might be more efficient um, for the city um, and save, save some money in those noticing costs? 
Well, I, for one, Mayor, would like us to have a look at that. And I don't want to take away from transparency or have anybody have any sticker shock, but I'm always, you know, always interested in seeing if there's ways in which that we can, you know, save the taxpayer a little bit of money and, uh, and also create a more efficient uh, meeting. Thank you, Councilmember Lohman. Council, any additional questions of Ms. Scipioni? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. I just had a quick question. I, it seemed to me that the that the fees that we discussed with uh, Mr. Junker a couple of weeks ago are in here. Do I have that right? Mayor and Councilmember De Alessandro, you do. Unfortunately, because of the timing of mailing the notices and when we needed to have the other ordinance in effect so we didn't have to notice for liquor license renewals, we have a bit of an issue with some of them not matching what you recently passed, so we're working on legal to clean that up and make sure it's correct in our ordinance. Okay, so we should expect to see a kind of a consent item at some point that just cleans up the table? Correct, Mayor and okay. Council. However, that shouldn't impact our current licensees as the amusement device licensing provision has been removed and all of our laundry facilities are currently already still paying that highest fee so it doesn't really impact day-to-day -day operations for Great. them thank you also further questions if not i will open the public hearing at item 4.2 this evening this is a public hearing regarding the proposed license and permit fee changes anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to item 4.2 this evening mr brillard do we have anyone on the phone wishing to speak to item 4.2 Mayor, no one on the line. Last call for the chambers. Council, no one in the chambers coming forward, no one on the phone wishing to speak. I would look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 4.2. So moved. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 4.2 this evening. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council, any questions on this? Councilmember uh, Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have a question, just a quick disclosure. Please. I'm impacted by these fees. I have a license for a rental unit in the city. Um, just want to make sure people are aware of that. Um, I don't believe it reaches the threshold to recuse myself because I'm treated no differently than any other rental license holder on there, and it's $6, and it's an increase. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and, and I had no influence on the amount of it or anything like that. Just, but just want to make sure people are aware that this impacts me, too. Thanks. I appreciate that, Councilmember Nelson. Also, if there's no other questions or comments on this, I'd look for action on item 4.2. Mayor, I'd be happy to make that motion. Councilmember Lohman. Mayor, I'll move to adopt an ordinance amending PDX A, administrative relief, and fee schedule of the city code relating to fees for licenses and permits. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua to adopt the ordinance amending Appendix A, administrative relief, and fee schedule for the city code related for fees and uh, for to fees for licenses and permits. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Councilmember Lohman, summary publication. Mayor, moved to adopt a resolution directing summary publication of an ordinance amending PDXA, administrative relief, and fee schedules of the city code relating to fees for licenses and permits. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua for a summary publication. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much, Ms. Scipioni. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Item 4.3 on our agenda is a public hearing regarding our proposed city code amendments and comprehensive plan text amendments for single and two-family residential standards. Mr. Johnson from our planning staff is here once again. Good evening, Mr. Johnson. Welcome. Mayor, how are you? Very well. How are you this evening? Members of the council, I also have a short PowerPoint presentation by my standards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to get going here. Okay, this looks like the right one. Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity this evening. Um, so I'm just gonna provide some short updates following uh, the city council discussion on May the 1st and uh, uh, provide just a little bit of procedural background in terms of where we are at in the process and why um, having another public hearing uh, yet this evening. Uh, so this process started back in uh, the end of October in 2021. So it's been a 19 month process uh, that's involved multiple uh, advisory boards and commissions as well as uh, significant discussion with the city council and a whole multitude of uh, public feedback and input opportunities. Um, there's been four, pub this tonight would be the fourth public hearing uh, associated with this project. Uh, one held by the planning commission in December of last year. And then the th this would be the third uh, city council public hearing. So as you all recall at the May 1st uh, city council discussion, uh, the goal of that um, 
uh, evening's work was to reach consensus on all the various sub-items held within the ordinance. Uh, it was a very good discussion. As part of that discussion, staff was directed to prepare two versions of the ordinance. Uh, the full ver version, which will be presented to you tonight as option A, uh, reflects the version recommended by the Planning Commission as well as other subsequent advisory boards uh, and staff. Um, and then, uh, and uh, uh, that is the version of the ordinance that the public and uh, other interested parties have viewed and reviewed throughout the, the entirety of the process. Uh, we were also directed to prepare a alternate, alternative, excuse me, um, uh, version of the ordinance, which we're calling option B, which reflected all of the items of full consensus, so unanimous consensus on the part of the council as part of kind of the straw poll or head nodding uh, exercises as we were doing uh, earlier in May. Um, so just a point about that. And then um, just procedurally speaking, uh, I want to note uh, for the record that we uh, did advertise another public hearing tonight uh, for the reason that we also have this option B uh, ordinance. So in order to satisfy all of our statutory and city code requirements, uh, we did advertise it as another public hearing opportunity on the basis of the alternative ordinance option B. So on tonight's agenda, as I said, I, I have uh, not too many slides. Um, the, the first item is just to pre present you uh, options A and B, uh, just high level overview. Then I'm gonna talk about uh, some analysis or study that's been discussed throughout the, throughout the process focused on the RS1 zoning district as well as environmental standards that serve uh, or are applicable to low density uh, residential areas in Bloomington. Uh, and then I'll prov provide a brief overview of some work that staff did in order to collect uh, kind of scholarly or academic research about uh, zoning and its impact on housing costs, particularly in low density uh, areas. And then uh, I will present to you uh, a list of recommended actions um, as proposed by staff. So getting to ordinance options A and B, I mentioned uh, I provided an uh, overview in my timeline slide, but option A is the full version as recommended by Planning Commission uh, and the bodies listed on the slide. Um, option B is the al alternate uh, or the alternative ordinance that does reflect all that uh, uniform consensus uh, or unanimous consensus on the part of council. Um, I want to uh, reiterate um, or uh, highlight the items that option B does not include. Option B does not include reductions to the R1 district minimum lot size and lot width. It does not include the requirement for a median uh, lot width requirement, uh, which is proposed to be removed in the full ordinance. Uh, so that would remain. Uh, and then it also does not include uh, allowances for increased maximum impervious surface on uh, residential lots less than 11,000 square feet. Um, so those are the key uh, provisions that it does not include. So throughout the packet, um, you'll see the two different ordinances with headers listed clearly uh, with the different options that they represent. We also have um, in the packet uh, different versions of summary publication and other documentation that kind of goes along with those two uh, alternative options. So hopefully that's clear. This is the same information, but we've provided this document throughout uh, most of the process, so I just want to um, show it for the public uh, that this is kind of the summary uh, table. This is all the key provisions. It's hard to read the text on the slide, of course, but this is the key provisions of the ordinance. Um, and the, the ones that are highlighted in yellow are the provisions that are not included in uh, ordinance option B. So just showing that for folks who have been following along with more the, the cheap sheet or the crib sheet uh, version of the ordinance. Uh, one thing that was discussed at the May 1st um, city council meeting that staff interpreted to reach council consensus on was the desire to have a mailed notice associated with uh, type one plats that are specifically for lot splits of two lots or resulting in two lots or less. Um, uh, so we, this was not something that was incorporated into previous versions of the ordinance per the council direction we did uh, include this item. Um, uh, more um, notice is always good. I do wanna take this moment to point out that there is not a, uh, a large amount of precedent in the Bloomington City Code for notification that is not uh, connected or associated with a public hearing opportunity. So staff reiterates the same concern we uh, talked about last time that for some folks, um, getting a public notice uh, that's disassociated from a public hearing opportunity may uh, provide some confusion or uh, in some cases even some frustration. That's not to say don't do it. I'm just saying that it does come with some potential uh, downside in that regard. Um, so just a heads up about that. And this is this uh, added content is reflected in both ordinance options A and B. 
So moving on to the district, uh, the RS1 district study and the environmental standards analysis. So staff is specifically uh, seeking direction on kind of three things associated with these two broader topics. So just a couple of procedural notes here. One is whether to pursue a formal study of these things. We, uh, again, kind of with the straw poll or the head nodding, uh, at the May 1st uh, meeting, we felt like we had uh, the consensus of the body that it is something important that the, the city uh, should invest staff resources into studying these items. Um, that being said, uh, we would like to request that a formal motion be made uh, directing staff to do so. And I'll talk maybe a little bit why that's important in the, the third item. Um, we're, uh, the next two slides, I'll get into those specific two topics, but we are uh, seeking if there's any preliminary feedback that the City Council wants to give staff about what we should be researching as part of these topics. Uh, that's certainly uh, helpful feedback for staff as we uh, begin our investigation. And then on the third item, uh, as, as you all know, um, the Planning Commission has an annual work plan. We adopted the 2023 uh, work plan in January of this year. Uh, and so something that staff will be seeking uh, feedback on is whether or not to pursue these uh, studies in the near term. Is it something that staff should prioritize, meaning in the 2023 timeline, or is it something that should be added to the 2024 uh, Planning Commission work plan? So we're seeking feedback on that as well. And on that point, um, if uh, it is prioritized to the 2023 timeline, uh, I just want to present the possibility that it could delay uh, some additional projects as we shift around uh, staff resources um, uh, to look at that. Um, so just a heads up on, on that front. Get into the topics themselves. So this has been an area of interest both on the part of the council and uh, from members of the public uh, discussion around the city's large lot uh, single family zoning district, more commonly known as RS1. So there's 120 of these uh, properties in Bloomington. Um, uh, and so as part of this uh, analysis or investigation, um, I mean, frankly, it started as some uh, interest on the part of some property owners to potentially look at rezoning their properties to RS1. So certainly that's been part of this discussion. Um, but as part of that, it, it's elicited a lot of uh, discussion about what the district intent of RS1 should be. Uh, for example, should it incorporate other characteristics like habitat corridors or other things that should make it worthy for such designation. Um, so that's something that certainly we would look at as part of this. And then what are the appropriate performance standards uh, for this district? You know, this district was uh, kind of tweaked um, uh, in the early 2000s. So uh, going back to look at these standards and whether or not it matches up uh, with what's appropriate for these areas. Uh, I, and I should also add um, that uh, I think it was also raised as an equity component. We're looking at the majority of all the other R1 uh, zone properties or, or low density residential properties. Uh, we should be evaluating these properties as well. Um, and then uh, staff's hobby horse is this uh, bullet number two is uh, establishing consistent criteria. Um, uh, should the, the city make any tweaks or changes to this uh, zoning district as part of this eventual study um, uh, that staff would urge uh, establishing rigid um, or consistent criteria uh, in terms of how you would receive um, a request for rezoning from the public theoretically. Get into the environmental standards analysis. Um, uh, so these are kind of the key components that we've identified that we think uh, should be looked at uh, for low density residential areas. Uh, it involves tree preservation, steep slopes, uh, landscaping requirements, uh, but we're open to the idea that there certainly could be some other things that we could be looking at just in terms of uh, kind of the growth of sustainability and other uh, professionals who are uh, more interested um, uh, kind of in these topics. There certainly is increasing amounts of research uh, of things that could be incorporated into uh, zoning regulation uh, that might help mitigate some uh, impacts from development. Um, what I would note, one thing I don't have included on this list, and I tried to focus on that last session, I don't, uh, we're not recommending to include stormwater management uh, into, those, into this analysis. The reason for that being is that uh, currently we feel that we're adequately served by the regulations that are on the books today. Uh, and the secondary reason is that it's a multi-jurisdictional review typically. There's other um, jurisdictions that are involved in the review of stormwater management and on the part of wetlands, uh, state law uh, that comes into play. Um, so um, uh, staff is not including stormwater management. Certainly that stormwater management is always a feature of development and everything we look at and certainly would be part of the discussion of some of these other things. If you preserve more trees, that's beneficial from a stormwater management perspective. Um, and other things, and steep slopes is obviously highly tied to stormwater management as well. 
Um, uh, but just a, a point and note about that. So we conducted a literature review. Um, we got our, our old JSTOR uh, and uh, uh, planning journal uh, subscriptions, and we uh, punched them in, and we did uh, we searched uh, various terms that we thought uh, would get us some good material that's uh, related to this topic. We did find eight uh, articles uh, that we feel are tangentially related to the broader topic. Uh, one of those studies is more recent and is um, uh, more applicable to kind of our current region. Uh, the other seven uh, are mostly studying other regions within the United States um, and come from various time periods all following 2000. So what are the lessons that uh, can be drawn that are, uh, that are directly applicable to Bloomington? It's difficult. And the reason being is that uh, regulatory environments from one jurisdiction and one region to region, one state to state, are all very different. They all have different state laws. They all have uh, different physical characteristics that warrant very different uh, environments for regulation. Um, and then the other reason being is that the housing markets uh, between all these places are very different and also vary depending on the time that the study uh, took place. Um, so there's a number of different reasons why uh, it's difficult. And then maybe most importantly is that um, there is very few uh, studies, because they try and draw to make it statistically significant, they look at a bri uh, broad or a large number uh, of jurisdictions, it's very hard to find uh, studies that are directly uh, aligned with the specific zoning changes that are being proposed uh, here in Bloomington. Um, I think there was uh, some council members who talked about peer uh, cities in the region who are looking at some of these changes, and that's true, there are some peer cities, uh, but really we're at the leading edge uh, of this thing. And um, as we mentioned about a question about kind of creating pilot zoning or um, how do we kind of study this better in a, in a strict way? We really think it's going to take a minimum of five years of data to really draw any kind of even early initial uh, conclusions about uh, how these regulations are either working or not working um, in terms of uh, achieving the, the overall project goals, which we've talked about as part of the project. So um, that's why it's difficult to draw uh, some conclusions. That, that being said, and I and I'm certainly can make some of these materials available to interested parties, uh, but there was some consensus over the, the, the eight um, articles. And those consensus does uh, reveal that there, generally speaking, is a correlation between uh, housing costs and specifically increasing uh, or the rate of increase of housing costs and stricter density uh, land use control. And the reason being is that it, uh, stricter density or land use controls uh, uh, control supply. They don't allow uh, or they don't stimulate supply at the same rates as more relaxed zoning regimes do. Um, so that, that was a definite correlation uh, um, or a connection factor between the different studies. Uh, the other thing that uh, did come out of those studies is that uh, more relaxed land use control uh, environments, uh, you're still going to have um, rates of uh, increase of housing costs. It's very hard to stimulate that on the basis of the, the housing ecosystem presentation that you saw um, uh, from Administrator Coleman on May the 1st uh, about how many factors are just not in the control of uh, local jurisdictions. Um, but that being said, what some of these studies found is that more relaxed um, uh, zoning regimes or cities with more relaxed land use controls had slower rates of uh, increased housing costs than cities that had stricter um, uh, land use uh, regulatory environments. So it's really about the rate, you know, and that's can, uh, you know, that can be percentages uh, sometimes or even modest uh, difference, but even those modest differences can have a big impact um, uh, over time. And I, just to note that these, uh, the, the studies that really did reach consensus, they're more based on the long-term as opposed to short-term time windows. I think one of the articles did talk about um, short-term uh, inflationary or uh, increased co uh, costs associated with regulatory environments. Those things are due to, are uh, witnessed or are visible sometimes in the short term. In the long term, that's where these consensus uh, items that we found in these studies uh, came from. So just a, um, uh, I talked a lot about, you know, the robust amount of public input. I, I did a quick count uh, earlier today. I think we've received over 60 forms of written correspondence um, uh, associated with this case, kind of going back to December of last year. Uh, you did receive uh, letters from Housing First Minnesota and the Minnesota Realtors Association, just in terms of trade or industry groups who have uh, interest in uh, these policy areas. Um, the city's HRA and HR uh, Human Rights Commission both also uh, provided their perspective 
uh, on these items and felt it important to uh, weigh in on this policy. Um, and then in terms of just public testimony, correspondence, and engagement, there's been a significant amount. We've had a lot of in-person live testimony, um, verbal testimony uh, at the four public hearings, as I mentioned, or three uh, to date before now. Um, I know they've. I know that uh, folks have been providing feedback at city council listening sessions too. So let's include that as well. Um, and then just many uh, numerous emails and letters. And I would actually add to that phone calls that staff has gotten. Staff has gotten a lot of phone calls. There's a lot of people interested in this topic um, uh, uh, for a whole wide variety of reasons. Uh, so it's uh, it's definitely interesting that way. Um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, I think at the January 9th. Uh, council meeting, I think the charge was put upon staff to try and do more robust engagement and get people talking and to get a lot more feedback uh, about this policy. And I hope we've accomplished that uh, to date as part of this process. So um, it's uh, certainly within the mayor and council's discretion about how to uh, kind of tackle these different recommended actions uh, that staff has put forth for you here uh, this evening. But this is the recommended sequence that we would suggest for you. Um, as you consider um, uh, these different actions, we would suggest first to um, uh, consider ordinance option A, which is the full version. Um, it's not just because it's the version staff recommends, but it's the version your planning commission uh, is recommending to you as the main advisory uh, land use body. Um, if uh, ordinance A is not, uh, or option A is not adopted at that time, then we would suggest to you to consider uh, ordinance option B uh, and go from there. Irrespective uh, of which ordinance option um, uh, the council uh, takes action on, if one is approved, uh, we would suggest authorizing a resolution of public uh, summary, um, summary publication. I'm sorry, I misspoke there. Um, and then following that action, uh, there still is the vote um, on the comprehensive plan, the associated comprehensive plan text amendment. Um, uh, again, uh, that is necessary in order to make the city's comp plan uh, simpatico uh, with uh, the public policies um, that were put forth in the different ordinances, irrespective of which option you select, uh, actually. Uh, and it's also intended to kind of clean up some uh, regulatory um, uh, lack of clarity uh, uh, in some of our low density areas. And then finally, uh, this wasn't included, I think, on the cover sheet, but tonight just adding this uh, for your consideration would be just to, to give us formal direction on um, uh, what to study for as far as RS1 and the environmental standards, and then um, maybe not in the motion, but at least um, uh, informal feedback about the timing um, of when to prioritize it, when to pursue it. So with that, I have some recommended motion uh, language. I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Council questions, Mr. Johnson? Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Johnson, can you just clarify the, the mailing um, change? That is in both of these options, that, that we'd mail notices, um, or is that a separate question that's before us? Mayor Councilmember Nelson, it is in both options A and B. Um, uh, we interpreted the discussion to be that there was broad support for that. Um, at the May 1st meeting. So we included it in both options. You don't need a separate uh, action to include it. If you did not want to include it, that would require some uh, type of intervention. <laughs> um, and then uh, if I could follow up question to that, are there any other changes that are impacted going to a type one from a type two or if I'm understanding that, is there anything else that would be changed or is it just the mailing? Mayor Councilman Nelson, it's just the mailing. Okay. Um, yep. So we're not suggesting to have a public hearing. That was kind of part of the cost savings and part of the time savings. Of, is, of grouping is, I guess in. is there a fee cost difference for the um, person building the house? Uh, Mayor Councilmember Nelson, there would not be. It's a $250 fee, um, regardless of whether you do a mailed notice or not. So, okay, thank you. Yep, for the preliminary plat. There's a final plat too, separate fee. Councilmember Loman. And Mayor Moore, this is maybe maybe a question just for you. Um, just you know, uh, earlier staff talked about the the, uh, the the concept. The reason why we're having a you know another public hearing tonight is because we wanted to consider um, you know, a couple different pathways to uh, go down um, uh, with this process. And so, uh, if we um, you know heard something tonight uh, that would substantially change that. Would we uh, be in a position uh, where we need to come back, you know, yet another time, or is it, you know, uh, you know, depending on what those changes would be? Um, 
I'm not, I'm not suggesting that it be any changes, but I just, just so I understand, you know, kind of what we've, we've placed forward uh, here tonight. Just trying to frame it up here. Thank you, Councilmember Lohman. Uh, I, my goal is we come to resolution on this this evening. We talked about this last time that um, I, I wanted to bring it back one final time. I think staff totaled it up, and we've been we've talked about this for eight and a half hours total now, and in in, uh, in meetings here in the chambers. And um, so I think it's time for us to come to resolution one way or another. That'd be a record. I don't know that there's many other things that we've talked about to this that. level. Uh, uh, and I just wanted just to, to just to be real clear, so that both that we as the body understand what we're trying to accomplish tonight, uh, and what the expectations may be from the from the public. That is, uh, you know, we, we've we've talked about all different di different ideas and a lot of things. So just to try to focus in in on what we're trying to get accomplished this evening. And I I would say we've by the end of our discussion tonight we have chewed through this as as. Uh, comprehensively and completely as we possibly could, and it's time to, to make a decision. Council, additional questions of Mr. Johnson? Thank you. I'll be Very here. Good. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. So this is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing on item 4.3. This is regarding the city code amendments and comprehensive plan text amendments for single and two-family residential standards. Uh, I, I will say we, we had a discussion about the possibility. Right now we have officially... Uh, we allow five minutes per, per, per speaker uh, during our public hearings. We talked about possibly amending the rules because this is the third time that we've had a public hearing on this to, to bring it down to, to three minutes perhaps. Seeing that we've got a, a reasonable number of folks here, if we had uh, you know, a full council chambers, I might uh, consider that. But I think the fact that we've got a reasonable number of folks here, I think my recommendation was we just move forward with the five minutes and, and continue with that. So uh, I have officially opened the public hearing item 4.3. Uh, I think I know that please come forward and let's uh, let's pass around the, the clipboard if folks want to sign in ahead of time so we can make sure that everybody who wants to speak can speak and they get signed up and ready to go. And as I and as I said, we do we will we'll stick with our five minute limit and um, the clock on the wall, the shot clock on the wall will give you an indication of where you are in terms of your time. If you could identify yourself for the record, please, and then start your Yes, my name is Fred Sauer, and I've been a Bloomington resident for over 30 years. And I want to thank the mayor and the council for letting me speak again this evening. Um, and just to be clear, I would like to have the council vote down option A, and I'm, I'm in favor of option B. So I just want to make that perfectly clear at the start. And last time I addressed the council, it was about affordability and affordable housing and everything else. Since that time, the HRA has given this council some information about what it would cost to build an affordable single family house of affordable housing. We gotta be very careful with our terms here because some people say affordable but I'm talking about affordability, um, affordable housing. <clears throat> the HRA presented to this council a way to build houses that were over $400,000 each. And of that $400,000, over half of that was subsidized. So don't don't get me wrong. I'm I'm all in favor of affordable housing. My wife and I have been contributing to Habitat for Humanity for many many years. But if it's going to take over a quarter million dollars to subsidize each individual house, how many houses do you think you're going to be building that are affordable housing here that are single family? I don't see how it's necessary to change the uh, lot size zoning um, throughout all of R1 for these couple of houses that may be built. There's got to be a better way to do it. Um, since I spoke to you last time, the discussion seemed to have changed from affordability to having higher density. I, I remind, I kindly remind the council that that was not something that you had put in as one of your goals. You didn't say anything in your goals well, for the original um, proposal for higher density. Um, 
And, and since then, the, there was also discussion about East versus West Bloomington. I take a strong exception to that. I think that the data will show that there are as many properties, more properties on the east side that could be affected by the, by the zoning changes that allow for smaller lots. I don't know how many people you've spoken to who, are, who plan to live on the east side, who are current homeowners, who plan to live there for a long time and um, have neighbors that could split their lots. I don't know how many you've heard from. Um, I, I'm sure that they're there, and I assume that they haven't come and spoken to this council because they just aren't aware of how it will affect them. Um, I guarantee that if you should pass option A and one of these homeowners sees their neighbor sell their house to a developer and that lot gets split in half, two big houses are going to be put up to replace the modest rambler that was there. You're going to hear about it. I've attended many Bloomington City Council meetings over the many years that I've lived here. And the city council has almost always come to a unanimous consensus on any vote. Um, I've seen some 6-1 votes, but almost always it's a 7-0 vote. I would really hate to see an issue like this that's so important on option A go down, be passed on a 4-3 to three or even a 5-2 to two vote. So... Um, please remember your motto, one Bloomington, one Bloomington. Again, I ask you to vote, I respectfully ask you to vote down option A. Thank you very much for listening to me this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarr. Thanks for your comments. Council, Kim Vosolovich, 329 Norman Ridge Drive. Good evening, welcome. Thank you. I think it'll be about 30 seconds. My <laughs> ask, I know this has been a, a laborious topic, one that we've all probably invested more time than we've wanted to on this topic. I know, including myself, uh, the neighbors spent a lot of time petitioning. We've brought a lot of stuff forward. So uh, my only ask is that the, neighbor, the Norman Ridge Drive group get considered in the discussion for RS1, regardless of what happens here tonight or gets passed. So however however that goes down logistically, we ask that we could be considered in that discussion uh, for RS1. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Ms. Velas Velas Ms. V. Ms. V, we'll just go with Ms. V. It was good, it was good, you were it's, close. I was close, I know. <laughs> Others wishing to speak this evening? Sandy Himley, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council. I just wanted to reinforce what Mr. Sauer said that we are looking for what we stated in January. We are looking for protection of the environmental aspects of Bloomington. We do not believe Bloomington is a one size fit all. Most of us came here specifically for something whether it was the parks or in our particular area, the wildlife and the trees. And our request or my request is that Bloomington does not have, we're big enough, we're 80, 90,000 residents that we can have more than one zoning. So my request is since nothing has changed from planning since day one, it just seems disingenuous to hear that we've spent hours and hours and hours and hours just trying to reinforce what they originally came up with. And I just hope that there's consideration given to protecting the characteristics of Bloomington. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Emily. Please. Hi. Uh Nathan Reeder, 2861 Overlook Circle. Um, 
So um, I haven't spent much time thinking about this per se because I didn't know, but you all have spent a lot of time, and I appreciate that. Um, I have spent thousands of hours in my house, in my yard, working, investing in my home um, because I love my lot and I love Bloomington and I love the turkeys and the birds and the, the deer and the beautiful white pines in my backyard. Um, I love the trees that were ripped out of my neighbor's yard and not, I haven't, I don't know what happened there, but so I see my white pines and I think, well, those are probably going to get killed and, and they're probably going to be gone and, and, you know, there will be no, you know, they'll just be gone. That'll be that. So, um, you know, I wonder why we're at the leading edge. The gentleman said we're at the leading edge. We're one of the largest communities in Minnesota. Why are we experimenting? with one of the largest communities. Um, it, it's self-evident that reducing zoning is gonna, re, is gonna make things more affordable. I mean, if it's a wild west and you can have any lot size you want, theoretically, then it's gonna be cheaper because it's not gonna be as desirable or as valuable. And so um, I think it's gonna have a chilling effect on investment from homeowners. If I know that my neighbor's lot can get sold to a developer and split, I'm moving before I put money into my house. And, and hearing about this makes me wonder if I should have invested in my home in Bloomington or if I should have moved to a community where my, my property rights and values would be protected. So, and I, I know I'm not alone in this. Um, obviously, affordability is an important issue. There's no question about it. The question is, is just sort of going from 100 foot to 60 feet is that going to help that? Um, it seems like a fairly drastic change. It seems like a step change would be a more sensible change um, in such a large and diverse community as Bloomington. So that's why between the choices A and B, I would certainly be in favor of, of option B. And uh, I respectfully um, submit my thoughts to the to council today. And I appreciate your time and giving me the chance to share my feelings. Thank you, Mr. Reeder. Good evening. Welcome. Good, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, members of the council, my name is Nick Erickson. I'm uh, Senior Director of Housing Poly for Policy for Housing First Minnesota. I want to th uh, thank you for, again, this uh, important conversation and commend your staff for their diligent work and for allowing us to participate in the process with a cost analysis. Uh, this is really among the most bold visions that we've seen uh, in housing policy here in the state and it does reflect the, the national movement uh, that has started on housing affordability and access. Um, as uh, your staff indicated, that when you do add more housing, it actually does slow housing cost growth. It actually will make Bloomington a more attractive community, uh, not just to uh, potential uh, buyers, renters, but the existing residents. It does help drive down housing costs. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about environment and, and protecting. Uh, it's important to note that all housing that will be built following the enactment of this proposal will be done to the environmental standards of uh, 2023 and beyond, which is far greater than the environmental standards of, of many of the house homes and houses built uh, in the state or in this community prior uh, to uh, the enactment of this proposal and really what you have with options a and b are, are two, a tale of two cities uh, that could be bloomington's future uh, option b uh, giving a carve out to uh, certain uh, parts of the community uh, does um, you know kind of bring questions as to what is the proper role for the state in choosing uh, housing policies for our communities if we're allowing certain communities to, to, to get a carve out uh, when uh, there is no true environmental uh, reason to do so. Uh, option B is really the bold vision um, where Bloomington could be a leader and a template for Minnesota. Um, really, I ask you to support option A as it will have the greatest impact on housing affordability and access in the city of Bloomington. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Good evening. Welcome. Steve Ryan, uh, 3001 Overlook Drive. Hello, Mayor and City Council. I just need to add my thoughts on um, the comments that the rest of the homeowners here have made regarding why we live here and how we feel about our properties. Um, what I'm hearing is that these um, ideas have been proposed regardless of 
uh, proximity to natural habitats and adding more properties within smaller areas is going to eliminate that freedom for those animals that we all came here to roam. Um, the nature of the trees that we all love and support in this, in this community are a big part of our lives and why we live here. Um, we have just gone through a major tax increase and uh, that hit th those properties a little bit harder per uh, some conversations I've had with city members about why that happened. Um, we're, we want to stay in Bloomington. We love the treatment we've had from the city here. And I just wanted to share my passion as a homeowner about considering not passing A. Um, the lot sizes uh, don't really add anything to the value of our property doing that, nor do they sustain the nature that we came here for. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Brian Savig, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, don't have a polished presentation. I wasn't expecting this to come up tonight. Um, but I really see this as a mom, dad, and apple pie issue. This is, this is uh, you're considering changing the social contract between citizens and, this, and the government. And that may seem grandiose or something like that, but we all came to Bloomington here anticipating and expecting the rules that were in place. And that, you know, I understand that change happens and so forth, but what you're considering here is permanent. Once you change a property and put two houses there, once you change a house and put two families where one were before, that's permanent. I, I just believe, you know, to me it's like citizenship, except you're restricting it. Instead of expanding it and making it more broadly based, you're reducing it. And I don't see you representing the current residents. We voted for you guys. You're, you're attacking the social contract that we came here from. I've heard testimony from the council that's, that made statements like, oh, you can, you know, there's no evidence that uh, increasing density creates social problems or anything like that. When I was in school, and that was a long time ago, there were all kinds of studies talking about how density increased social issues. I mean, I don't live in the area that has been strongest in opposing this, but I just think this is a, a referendum type issue, not a let's vote on it. And whether it's eight hours we've talked about it or 50, it's a basic issue. It's a basic, your home is a mom, dad, and apple pie situation. Um, we're talking about something that even our planning department is saying, it'll be five years before we know how well this has worked and whether it was a good idea or not. You're talking about making permanent changes and then finding out five years later whether that was a good idea. I'm gonna argue that every single change has affected some citizens that never anticipated it would be like that. And it isn't whether there's a bike lane in the, in the road, so my four lane road went down to two and that's a, inconvenience. This is something you come home to every night and live there. And so, you know, I, 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 I guess it's a, it's, it's a do or die thing that it's, it's the citizens' rights versus the government's to impose. You're talking about something that's restricting, that you are, okay, you're, in, you're enlarging the city I don't see why growth is so important when it's going to impact negatively the people that already live here. And those are the ones that voted to put you where you are. So anyway, that I, I would say it needs more discussion and more city involvement and more resident involvement. And I think if you make a decision tonight to lock something in, I think you're locking the people that you represent out. And 
I'm sorry to make it such an in-your-face thing, but I really do feel it's a basic situation. It's, it's what you live for. It's what you build your future for. It's what you bring your family here. Invest in. And I see you got 45 seconds, so thank you very much for hearing me. Um, I hope you'll take my remarks under consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Savage. Good evening. Um, my name is Denise Royer. I live at 10348 Pleasant Avenue South. I am here this evening to indicate that I am a strong advocate of housing affordability as it affects ownership as well as rental. I'm also here to ask that you support ordinance option A. Um, as I have reviewed the information and listened to our hearing, there are many factors involved, and I have to give great credit to the staff that has helped try to clarify issues, as well as all of you as council members and mayor to understand um, the complexity as it relates to housing. I, I guess, um, this evening we heard about the um, the subsidy that that may be needed to help bring about some um, new housing that would be more affordable. And I guess um, my experience is that sometimes it takes a wide array of partners in order to come and make a change in regards to important issues. And if we need to have a lot of partners in a variety of funding, so be it. I think we need to do that and keep in mind our um, Bloomington strategic plan that was developed by many, many um, community members. And that um, keep in mind that we have Bloomington tomorrow together. So I um, encourage that you vote option, option A. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ryer. Can I come up just if I have a question? Yes, you may. Or do I have to have like a speech? You don't, you don't need a speech, no. Hi, I'm uh, Tanya Reeder, 2861 Overlook Circle. Um, so my question is, in option A with the, the smaller lot size that allows, obviously, more dwellings, um, and the connection to that helping affordable housing, is there anything in option A that says that the houses put on those new smaller lots has to be affordable? Or can a developer come in and put up a, $700,000 home. That's okay. So then I guess I do have a little speech. <laughs> um, it would be that I, I can I can see the theory that this would help with affordable housing. Um, but in many areas of Bloomington already before this, you have houses being torn down and big, beautiful houses being put up. And so I think that would still be a draw for developers in Bloomington, because it's a wonderful place to live, um, especially like you know where we are, we have a lot of wildlife and a lot of natural beauty, and I don't necessarily think that these two are tied together intrinsically, and so what we may end up happening with option A is you think it's going to help affordable housing, but actually what it's doing is just opening it up for developers to come in and put up expensive houses, and you know wealthy people move in, and I mean. That's fine too, but it's it's not actually doing what the intent of it was in the first place, and so I just want to give my opinion that um, there may be a downside to it in that you're affecting the current residents. Like a lot of people have already said, the people who actually already live in Bloomington are being affected negatively, and then the people that you're wanting to help to be able to have affordable housing aren't actually being helped because it's just a developer coming in and building a big house if there's no rule about that. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Reeder. Mm -hmm. 
And I would actually ask staff to uh, to answer Ms. Reader's question for us after we get done with the public hearing. Yes. And unless there's anyone else coming forward, uh, Mr. Brillert, do we have anyone on the phone wishing to speak to this item? I would like to come forward. One second. Mr. Brillert, do we have anyone on the phone? Uh, Mayor, nobody on the phone. Okay, please. I appreciate your time this evening. My name is Jay Pester. I live at 3001 Overlook Drive. Um, wanted to speak to one of the things that's being proposed in relation to the permits pulled for the lot. Uh, there was something proposed about the uh, raising the maximum impervious soil usage, um, which hopefully you all know what that means. Um, I know Sean knows what that means. Um, it means there's going to be more runoff uh, from that property uh, that won't soak into the soil. And from a property owner that has more than a half acre, um, that impervious soil um, coverage has to go somewhere. And it feels to me like it's going on to current property owners that have more property. And it feels like it's an unsafe proposition uh, to creep this process forward uh, where it isn't stated what the raise in impervious soil usage is going to be. Um, so I wanted that to be shared that um, with a bigger structure, lots more paved area, it's going to affect people's homes that have been there and were not allowed larger uses of uh, of coverage of impervious soil. And uh, that's going to change topography uh, on some of the back lots that are on steeper slopes. And uh, so I wanted to share that feeling and know that that's a concern of property owners around uh, what you're looking to approve as increasing the maximum soil uh, usage of impervious soil. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Anyone else wishing to speak tonight? Please come forward. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Susan Jacobson from uh, Norman Ridge. And I just wanted to know, I haven't seen these stats. In Bloomington, what is the ratio we have for single-family houses, duplexes, apartment, affor apartments, affordable housing, Section 8, compared to other cities, other suburbs we're close to? like Edina, Eden Prairie, Burnsville, Woodbury. I mean, when I drive around Bloomington, we have all different types of housing, more than I see in Eden Prairie or Edina or any place else. So what are we striving to do here? And what are we trying to be in 20 years? We have a beautiful, I mean, we have more parks than any other city around that I know of as far as square footage, square, you know, things like that. So what's the goal here? Are we trying to wipe a lot of that out? So that's, I'd like to see those stats. Thank you, Ms. Jacobson. Anyone else? 
staff, uh, well, if you, you're jotting down those questions, I hope. Uh, Council, I see no one else coming forward. We've got no one on the phone. I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on tonight's, uh, tonight's public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Got a motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua to close the public hearing on item 4.3. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0, closing the public hearing. Mr. Johnson, uh, the couple of questions that came up. Uh, the first uh, regarding required minimum cost or required cost uh, if, if uh, a lot was developed. There were some questions or at least concerns regarding impervious surface. I don't know if there's anything there to address. And I don't know if you have at your fingertips the ratio of housing types that we have here in the city of Bloomington. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Maybe, uh, uh, before I address those specific questions, more of more a, a generic or general uh, comment about kind of the full um, uh, per, um, the full uh, scale of the project as it started from point A all the way to uh, point Z that we're here, uh, or maybe point point, uh, I don't know what letter, <laughs> we'll see. But um, I think this really gets to one of the things that's really important is just consistent messaging about what the project goals are, depending on who you're talking to and depending on uh, the questions that they're asking or the points that they want to discuss with you. Uh, typically, they'll zero in on one or maybe two of the uh, project goals. What we've tried to communicate throughout the entirety of the project is four different project goals. Um, and that does include adding housing uh, variety and new housing types uh, to Bloomington that can't, can't currently be built. Um, and that addressed some of the other discussion items that we've talked about um, uh, throughout the project. So I do want to reiterate, um, we've been guilty of ourselves of just kind of focusing on housing, uh, uh, home ownership affordability and closing the opportunity gap and some of those things. But there are all these other goals that we uh, uh, do value as well. Um, the uh, question about the housing cost uh, as far as the possibility of uh, more uh, expensive homes being built as a result of some of these changes, that certainly is a possibility. Uh, but one of the goals that we have, uh, in fact, I would say it's a likelihood, it's not a possibility, but one of the goals that we've had uh, in terms of some of the presentation, uh, again, thanks to Housing First for providing some of that analysis, is that we're trying to lower uh, the, co the, the costs for all different price points of housing as they come to Bloomington, so that that $700,000 house actually becomes six seventy-five dollars through a various uh, ways of um, uh, approval processes, uh, changes, and other uh, regulatory requirements that can reduce costs, land costs, and those types of things. Um, so depending on, regardless of what price point of home you're looking at, there is potential savings at all of those various price points. Um, the regulations affect all the properties uniformly, not just uh, the properties where you're trying to create affordable home ownership opportunities. Um, so hopefully I touched on that one okay. Um, on the 10th the speaker, I'm sorry, I didn't catch uh, your name, sir, but about the impervious, uh, sorry, impervious surface uh, questions, we did talk about that a little bit at May 1st. Homes that are built today are subject to, to the most strict stormwater management regulations, and this actually affects additions too, so I'm glad that there's a lot of homeowners uh, or residents here. Because uh, if you're planning a larger addition that includes more than 5,000 square feet of uh, land area disturbance, you are also going to be subject to uh, in installing some stormwater management facilities on your site, usually in the form of a rain garden uh, or in cases of more constrained sites. Uh, it could be a, a, a pipe gallery or some other uh, form of treatment. But the, the structure of the rules is that you cannot increase the rate uh, in which stormwater is leaving your property uh, from the precondition to the postcondition. That's the board. That's the, the how the rules are structured uh, in Minnesota and in Bloomington. Uh, so that's the baseline. Um, in terms of getting into the specifics of the regulation, um, the the proposed increase to 45%. So today, all properties are capped at 35%. All low density residentials capped at 35%. This would propose to increase to 45%, but just for properties that are below. 11,000 square feet uh, in area. And the reason for that is that engineering expressed this very same concern that if you allow all properties that are less constrained than a smaller lot uh, to exceed that, that it would uh, increase um, uh, burden on the city's stormwater management systems. Um, and that's just not the right solution. So the, the, the provision is strictly tailored uh, to the smaller lot. Uh, and in addition to the point about stormwater management being such an important uh, critical point. I don't have the, to the last question, I don't have the numbers offhand. Uh, Glenn, Glenn does have the numbers. But I, do, I don't believe Glenn's going to have the numbers of those other co communities that uh, were asked about is from a comparison standpoint. Mr. Markegaard, good evening. Sure. Uh, Mayor Bussey, council members, good evening. In terms of number of units, uh, the most readily available data was from our comprehensive plan. 
the 2016 data, so a little bit uh, old, but still uh, very germane. Uh, at that point, Bloomington had 37,670 units. And of that number, 58.6% were single family detached homes. 8.3% uh, were one unit attached homes, whether townhomes or side by side two family homes. Another 2.1% uh, were either over under uh, two family homes, triplexes or quadplexes. 30.6% uh, uh, were multi unit structures with five or more uh, units in the building and 0.4% were mobile homes at that point in time. And, and we do not have handy uh, the same statistics from other cities. We could easily find that, but I don't have that for you tonight. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you, Glenn. And if I can add one um, question or uh, comment to the end of uh, uh, the last speaker too was a concern about um, encroachment into the city's parkland. Um, I just want to be very clear uh, that these regulations are, as they're being proposed, are applicable uh, for projects in um, the existing low-density residential areas. There's been no uh, investigation or study of um, repurposing city parkland uh, for the purposes of creating housing. But I just want to put that fear to rest. And, and Mr. Johnson, I think somebody had a comment also regarding teardowns. What, what, what's the rate of teardowns in the city? Do we, do we see that at all? Certainly not to the level that they see in South Minneapolis and Edina. Mayor Busi, the numbers are uh, very modest. Um, uh, it is just a few demo permits uh, per year, typically, uh, and that you know, in the more recent environment, uh, little if any, um, at all. So no, it's not similar to that other environment or Edina uh, mm -hmm. that you um, uh, commented about. Very good, Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I have a follow-up question to that. Um, <clears throat> what would you? Um, and I don't know if you can answer this or not, but what would you say? led to the teardown environment in South Minneapolis and Edina? Like, were there certain conditions that made it just more, like, easier for people to do that? Like, I'm just curious from your perspective. Yeah, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Carter, this might even be a good question for someone with a development background uh, to weigh in. I don't know if um, uh, Housing First uh, gentleman would have any curious, or uh, would, what his feedback to that would be, but obviously it has a lot to do with those sub uh, real estate markets. They're just incredibly desirable to tip a property uh, to the point of being able to acquire a three, four dollars $400,000 lot uh, or property uh, demo it and still uh, drive a profit uh, for the builder or developer uh, executing that project. It's an incredible amount of value in those sub real estate markets around the lakes and uh, any Dyna, frankly. I remember a couple of years ago when it was like we were having affordable housing conversations and in a Dyna there were no homes under $350,000. And so they had this affordable housing trust fund and anyway, a lot of conversations. Um, but I do feel like in Bloomington, we are kind of on that trend, right, where our median home value has increased significantly over the past couple of years. Um, you know, Bloomington is a really desirable place to live. So I guess I, I just am asking myself, like, are we at risk of something like that happening? I don't know. But um, it's just kind of it made me wonder. So thank you for answering the question. Yep. Councilmember Loman. One question that I did hear as well. Uh, was uh, with regard to if we could make a requirement uh, within the zoning district for affordability. If you could help me understand, uh, so I think that was the gist of uh, one of the, the questioners. Uh, they wanted to know, you know, what restricts this or, or what, you know, makes sure that this is going to be affordable uh, uh, housing within the zoning. And so I just wanted to know what the... Uh, what can and can't we do within a uh, zoning district? Yeah, Mayor Busi, Council Member Loman, thanks for that question. Uh, zoning tools, zoning regulatory tools do not deal uh, with affordability. It's really the minimum rules that private actors um, go by. If there's a public project that involves some type of subsidy or even by a private actor, uh, nonprofit, et cetera, they can uh, place affordable uh, deed restrictions on the property that would be occupied by uh, a person with a certain income level uh, for a certain period of time. Uh, but as, as far as like a carte blanche applicable to a specific zoning district or a specific use, uh, I'm not aware that that is legal. I certainly would uh, welcome any feedback the city attorney has on that front. Um, but uh, not from my experience, that is not uh, a permitted approach. 
Any further questions of Mr. Johnson? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Just a quick clarification. It's actually probably for Mr. Market Guard. Um, the numbers that you gave, were they um, were they home ownership numbers or were they inclusive of home ownership and rental? Mayor Busi, Councilmember D'Alessandro, those were all units, uh, rental or ownership. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. So, Council, we have in front of us two options. We have the option A and option B that uh, staff brought forward. And we've, uh, as I mentioned, we have been, this has been discussed at length and uh, chewed up quite significantly. And uh, I, I do think, despite uh, what others might think, I do think we, we, we need to make, we need to move on this one way or another tonight. We need to, to decide how we're going to work on this and, and what we want the future to be in Bloomington, how we, how we want to set up to move forward. Uh, I will say I've, uh, you've heard it in my voice and you've heard it and seen it in my actions. I've been very hesitant regarding this um, with the, uh, the planning department, planning commission brought forward, option A basically. I've been very hesitant because uh, frankly I, I looked at it and thought, well this, this isn't going to be a big deal. This isn't going to make enough of an impact. We're talking, of, I'd be surprised if it's 10 units a year. I, I would be surprised and I just don't think it's going to, didn't think it was going to be this enormous impact. And frankly it frustrated me a bit because it didn't do enough. I didn't think it was, could do enough. And to hear the past couple of discussions that we've had, uh, to hear from uh, uh, Ms. Coleman last week regarding the, the housing continuum and, and the work that uh, needs to go into that, and, um, and discussions with folks about those 10 units obviously being among you know, 25,000 or so single family homes in the city of Bloomington, uh, it, it wouldn't be impactful to that group, but be, it would be very impactful to the 10 folks who actually move into a single family home. And, um, and then I had the opportunity, a couple of opportunities over the past couple of weeks, I actually spoke at the uh, Aon Beyond Bricks and Mortar event, uh, which is their annual, uh, an annual event that Aon uh, sponsors, and they're great partners within the city of Bloomington, and to hear stories about uh, uh, affordable housing needs within the Twin Cities, and to, to talk um, as I talked and, and kind of heard myself talking about this, the fact that, and we've talked about this, that uh, we're at 85% of our affordable housing goals in the city of Bloomington, uh, according to the Met Council's goals that they set us for 2030. And you've all heard me say it before. My guess is that puts us about 85% ahead of many of our neighbors right now. And it's frustrating to me because it seems like despite the work that Bloomington is doing, that we're, we're doing this alone. We're doing this kind of on, a, on an island and we're just kind of pushing forward and, and nobody else is following. Um, and then I, it, it started to change my thinking a little bit as I started thinking about this. Uh, the point that I brought up, that it's only 10 units a year, but it is an impact, a major impact for the 10 folks who move into a home. And frankly, in a, in a, a city the size of Bloomington with a number of units that we just heard Mr. Markergaard talk about, 10 units a year, it likely will not impact folks. I mean, it, it could be years before you could see any impact within your neighborhood or even within a sight line or, or the roads that you typically drive on. And then thinking more, uh, as uh, especially as we, we talked about the leadership that Bloomington has in so many issues, and to uh, actually to see the number of issues that Bloomington was in front of that the state is now just kept catching up on, or for that matter, the federal government is now just catching up on, whether it's flavored tobacco, vaping, uh, conversion therapy, earn sick and safe that we passed here in Bloomington, uh, acted in our leadership role that comes with being the fourth largest city in the state of Minnesota, that comes with being a, a suburb, not a, not a central city, but a suburb making these broad and bold changes to try and uh, improve the, uh, the community that we are, we are in, and then seeing others follow. I mean, cities look to Bloomington. They really do. And with that uh, all in mind and considering the, the, the neighborhood that I, I give them credit for uh, arguing this respectfully and thoughtfully and carefully and bringing forward uh, options, and I think it's, uh, it's been a, a healthy discussion. But uh, where I stand right now, uh, Council, after uh, now I think we're at nine and a half, we're pushing 10 hours of discussion on this. Uh, I, I am in support of uh, option A to move that forward so uh, Bloomington can continue this leadership in this area and can continue to be seen as, um, as a community that uh, is, is, is uh, 
is a place where people want to be, and not only want to be, but can be in a variety of different ways. And so uh, that's where I stand. And as I said, I've kind of been back and forth in, in our previous meetings on this and, and not really uh, convinced, but in the fact that we're trying to drive to decision tonight, I just wanted to let everyone know that's where I stand right now. Councilmember Lohman and Councilmember Martin. Councilmember so, Lohman. Mayor, let me ask you this question before I make uh, any other uh, comments here. Does it make sense for us to, to, to get this option A out there so we know kind of where we're working from? Because I'm more than happy to kind of get this thing out here so we can have some place to, to kind of work from if we want to work our way backwards. Uh, I think the staff recommendation was to, to move option A and see if we have the votes. And if we don't have the votes for option A, we then move to option B. Well, Mayor, I'd like to get this thing out there right now, uh, this option A, uh, and see if there's a second out there. And we certainly can have conversation, but I want to see if we can focus it on that A. So, so to your point. Do you, you want to make the motion for option A? Yep, let me go ahead and do that. Yep. Please do. So uh, uh, in the case of, of PL2 2022-21, I move to adopt an ordinance amending chapters 19, 21, 22 of the city code modifying requirements for single family residential and two family residential lots and dwellings related to definitions lot size with approval process, setback requirements, parking and garage requirements, planning and other related standards. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Lohman and a second by Council Member Marty, Martin for option A. Uh, additional discussion on option A now. Yeah, Mary, I thank you. I, I think we've got to uh, thank you for allowing us to kind of get this out there and get this clarified. And you know, I, I've got to say that, uh, you know, uh, when we gathered here um, many, many months ago, uh, we talked about the idea of the four things that were placed forward, you know, increasing affordable home ownership opportunities, providing home uh, housing options and housing types, providing uh, opportunities for infill housing and seek to address the home ownership opportunity gaps. Now, certainly I am, you know, I, I'll be the first person to tell you that I am very skeptical of, of two of those items that are on that list. Um, but when we, uh, you know, look to the fact that we don't do anything at all with that, well, <laughs> I don't, you know, if you, if you don't do any of those things, then you're not gonna really accomplish any of those things on that list. And, you know, I may not necessarily, uh, you know, agree with how we're going about doing this. I, I too, Mayor, feel like we haven't gone, no, haven't gone far enough, but we've got to start someplace. And the place where I think we've got to start is we've got to be clear about what we're trying to do here. But that doesn't mean for those neighbors that have come here tonight um, that I have not uh, forgotten about, you know, the things that you are concerned about. And I want to make sure uh, that uh, if we were to move this tonight, uh, the way that it is that we we, we don't forget about uh, those neighborhoods that are part of that. In fact, most of my district is going to be heavily impacted uh, by this. And so um, I'm, I, I know we've got a couple other things that are, are possibilities to have that conversation. I want to have those conversations, and I want to do that. I think the only way to really be uh, a leader is to get out there and, and try this stuff. Um, and, uh, and so I, for one, you know, looking at the neighborhoods uh, that we've got out there in terms of, you know, whether it be Overlook or whether it be um, any of the other neighborhoods that uh, have come before us, we need to look at how do we modify um, that RS1 uh, district and see if that, uh, where, where it makes sense to, to place folks there and where it doesn't. Um, beyond that, what I would say here is that, yes, I agree. This is a mom and pop issue. But... I come a little down on this a little bit differently. We, as property owners who own our property, have a freedom of choice about what we want to do. What we really are doing as elected officials are really opening up that opportunity for freedom of choice, for you to be able to decide what you want to do with your property. If we're going to make a concerted effort to be able to make change as it comes to affordable housing, we are going to have to take risks. We cannot continue to do things the same way that we've done before. Now, certainly, I, I, I am frightened about this, and there's some things about this that make me nervous, um, and it should make you nervous, but that's what change looks like. Um, and so we cannot stop simply here. We also need to, you know, all the things that, that folks have brought forward and the things that you're concerned about, just because I support this particular thing, I have not forgotten about that. And I'm going to work tirelessly to make sure that the things that you are concerned about, 
uh, about your property um, uh, and, and about the people that the neighbors that you live around um, the, the, that that those things are uh, looked at and we uh, look at those things and so let me wrap up by saying this I, I do not believe that simply that the environmental things should be contained to one zone if we are going to look at environmental standards we really need to look across the entire city you know we are also leaders in that as well just because we have densification, that does not mean that we don't have a sustainable uh, environment for folks to live in. We have, our, our folks that have come before us have done the great work of making sure that you know, about a third of our city is reserved for green space. And I don't think that we should, uh, just because of the way that our lot size looked, that we should you know, not do that. So let's continue to uh, find ways in which that we can continue to be leaders in everything that we do. This is gonna be hard and it's gonna be difficult, but I, I'm willing to, to work to make this uh, operate and work. But let's make sure that we don't forget about those neighbors who have true concerns about this. I think we should include the, uh, you know, look at the, uh, the, the other neighborhoods that have come before here and make sure they are included um, as we look at that study for RS1. Thank you, Councilmember Lohman. Councilmember Martin. All right, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, briefly, uh, I'll just add, because I think everybody knows where I stand on this. Uh, I was having a conversation the other night with one of my best friends. I've known him since kindergarten. We all grew up together. And, and I, I was talking about projects at the house and working in the yard, and, and this is my favorite time of year. And and he just kind of gave me this blank look, uh, and he was saying, like, that that might, that must be nice, because it's never going to happen to me. I'm never going to be able to do that. And, and he, he started talking, and, and I just heard echoes of so much of what I've heard, especially from the younger folks in my district or folks all over the region that I grew up with, that we were told to go to college, get a job, buy a house, settle down, um, which is true, and I believe in all that, but the cost of college has tripled in the last 30 years. You come out with 40 grand in student loans, good luck doing a down payment on a home at that point. You get a job, well, wages have been stagnant since the 70s, so good luck paying off the loans you've already got, much less the mortgage. And the value on my home, I, I'm extremely blessed. A lot of us are. It's it's up $160,000 in six years, which I, I get pretty jazzed up about, but has completely locked out so many of my friends from ever being able to put down roots the way I did, because I was lucky enough uh, to, to be able to work with my folks, and it was my great aunt's house that I bought. Uh, to, to buy it before the market went crazy. So I, I just, I appreciate that this conversation, it has turned into a mess in so many other communities that we see. I mean, neighbors screaming at each other and council meetings going all to heck. And so with, with, such, with such a topic that, as has been noted, is so critical to the future of the community, I, I support moving forward with option A, even just to say to this whole generation of folks that are gonna be the fabric of this city not too long from now, to say just, hold out hope. We're trying to build a city here. Even if we can't do it completely on our own, we're trying to build a city where you can put down roots, where you can own a home, where you can pursue that American dream that, that we've been told uh, our whole lives. And, and I think it's also a testament to this council. It's a testament to the neighbors that have come forward to collaborate, that moving forward with stuff, to Council Member Lohman's point, like the environmental standards studies, uh, coming up with, with more uh, specifications to be able to standardize some of these conversations moving forward, I think that's trailblazing in and of itself to say it doesn't need to be one or the other. This can be comprehensive. So uh, thank you to, to everybody for having this be a, a productive conversation. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I too want to thank everybody. Um, obviously, we've come to the end of a long road, and it's not for lack of trying to find consensus that, um, that we are where we are. Uh, so much, much appreciated to the folks here and on the phones and um, in the emails and in the face-to-face -face conversations. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure you all have the votes uh, that you need. Uh, can't say with certainty on that. Um, I, I'm not in support of option A, and, and here's why. And it has nothing to do with the ethos of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, there's no doubt that um, it, it's going to take a combination of items to get truly affordable housing built. Um, it's going to take more in all price points. It's going to take subsidies. It's going to take corporations stopping gouging prices for no reason other than they think they can get away with it. 
Um, it's going to take, uh, you know, uh, the the cyclical nature of of people moving in ways that allow for um, you know folks to move out of large homes and back into smaller places and this that and the other thing, and it's going to take an increase in the type of, of uh, options that we have. Um, so so it's going to take a lot of levers. This this is not the lever. I, I I'm I'm just surprised that this is the lever we think we should be pulling first. That's what I keep struggling with. Um, option B would have unanimous consent on this board. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, why we wouldn't do that and then find our way to more incremental work on this, I don't understand. Because even the Met Council will tell you that every year, this goes back to 2021, every year we're missing out on building the truly deeply affordable homes that need to be done. The gap is not there. The gap is we're okay even in their own words, at the 50%, 60% AMI in some cases. But we are behind by 86% on the stuff that's deeply affordable. I This change doesn't affect that outcome, in my opinion, at all, especially when we already have options on the table that would, and we can't seem to get traction on them, and we're not spending any time doing the work to try to get traction on them. We could build two family homes today and we could have been doing that for three years without ch touching the zoning code at all and we'd have those 10 people in their homes we'd have 20 people in homes and we're not doing it we're just not so I, I struggle with the idea that this is the thing that's finally going to change it all like that doesn't make any sense to me because there's too many other things that we already had available to us that didn't move the needle and all we're doing in the meantime is really setting a lot of folks who, who you know, fought, to use the terms that Mr. Bryan gave us, bought into whatever social contract they thought they were buying into, we're giving them a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt, but we're not changing. And I'm all for that. Like, I get it. Like, I have to manage people through change all the time. Like, I'm not, that's not the point. I don't know how to manage people through this change because it doesn't actually have a clear outcome that's worth the change in my mind. Other than setting the table, I mean, and if that's what we're here to do, fine. But I think if we if we did option B first and took the five year view and then said that didn't do it, that's not enough. Let's keep going. I think that would be a lot more comfortable for a lot of people. And so um, that's where I'm at at the moment. Uh, but you know, whatever it takes, I, I I I will be happy if those ten people get their houses either way. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> appreciate everyone's uh, time on this issue, and particularly to some of the people from Norman Ridge who have taken time not only in these meetings but personally to talk through it, uh, this issue and how it might impact them. Um, and uh, you know, I don't like to speak for other people, um, so I'll just tell you what I heard from from those meetings was a sincere concern about the environment, and I think that's shared by this entire council and frankly by the vast, vast majority of people in Bloomington. Um, and so to Councilmember Lohman's point, we, we can't drop that ball in my opinion um, either. And um, also some other concerns with related to rental policy and things like that. I think the end of the day, um, the change in the zoning on the lot sizes led to concerns about these other things. It was sort of an impetus to start that thought process. And so I think we have a, the opportunity to be holistic in these um, areas. You know, as noted before, uh, their area, their neighborhood has, has benefited from splitting lots. They have a lot of great neighbors who have, you know, beautiful houses in that neighborhood. Uh, so it's been an area that has been, has benefited from being able to split lots. Um, and I look at what this might do throughout the community where there's maybe a few more opportunities to do that. And so it might be another great neighbor, you know, but this isn't something that's going to take and transform entire city blocks or anything like that. It's going to maybe get one more in on a block or something like that. And so you have another good neighbor in terms of, um, you know, taking down buildings to build two, um, you know, the low hanging fruit there are the ones that are the most economically depressed. Um, and I'm hard pressed to see it as a negative to take out a dilapidated, poorly maintained house that's an eyesore in a neighborhood and build a nice house or maybe build two nice houses. And the economics of it are you're going to have to go to a bank 
and you're going to have to justify those houses to an underwriter in order to get them financed. And so, you know, you're going to have to have something that fits within the range of that neighborhood. It won't be significantly less expensive than that neighborhood, which I think is a concern that's been raised. How do we get affordable housing when we maybe aren't able to get there? And the answer to that is obviously subsidy. Um, but we're also not going to get houses that are tremendously outside of what that existing neighborhood is. Um, the reason, in my opinion, from what I've seen in Minneapolis, South Minneapolis and Edina, that the reason they have teardowns is basic supply demand. I mean, people want to live there and they're not making any more land. So, you know, if you want to live on, on a lake or near a lake, you know, you're going to pay for it. And the people with the money that can do that, they're going to build nice houses. And that, you know, frankly, has happened and will happen in Bloomington in some places. Um, but this proposal does the, some of the things that we've talked about. It, it does increase opportunities for home ownership. It does create opportunities for different types of products to meet different needs, whether it be, you know, younger families uh, trying to find that first house. I've I've made a point of saying this a couple times. I would not be I may not be in Bloomington if it wasn't for the first house I could buy a Rambler, and that house can't be built in Bloomington today. Um, not because of the lot size, frankly. I'll be candid about that, but it, it could not be built. And But we could take and find ways to build that house to give new families um, opportunities if we could create a few more lots. And that subdivision, that's why in my mind that subdivision portion of it is good because it'll bring in good families. It also gives us the opportunity for many of our seniors who are looking for options to move into, um, a, you know, particularly a place that they can age in place and, and stay there. And so creating those different opportunities. Um, we talked about, um, Mr. Johnson noted, the slower growth. One of the things I hear a lot of is, you know, my taxes keep going up every year. And yes, we had a significant levy increase last year due to uh, investments in police and fire. Um, but we have this council for years, or those who have been here, but the city has frankly held the line on taxes. What's driving up people's taxes is the increase in property values. You know? Councilmember Martin may be really happy about the $160,000 increase, but I'm sure that's hit the pocketbook every year on taxes. It has on my house, and it has on a lot of people's houses. This will not solve this. Ten houses a year is not going to solve this, but this done regionally, statewide, can. This is extraordinarily important, and to take a leadership role on that to help show Woodbury and Lakeville and Maple Grove that they don't need to be afraid of this. That, that, that this can be done, and it can be done in a thriving, vibrant community is a message we can send out there because we need to, you know, we need to do this in the entire region. And, you know, someone has to start it, and a lot of these things start somewhere, and then finally the legislature gets around to catching up with what's actually happening. And I will say that the reality is is we're not, we're leaders in the region, but not necessarily nationally. This is being done nationally all over the place, you know, in a lot of variety of states. Montana's doing it, as is Colorado, you know. I mean, you got Republican and you got Democrat. This is across the border. People are recognizing that zoning reform is a significant factor or significant uh, deterrent to building housing that people need at whatever price point. Um, I think it's also important to recognize, and, and Ms. Coleman had talked a lot about, a lot about this, Zoning is a tool of exclusion. And what we are doing is opening up opportunities for people and excluding fewer people. And um, I, for one, am not a really big fan of excluding people. And I, I don't think we can ignore the history of this. I don't think that's what's happening here in terms of the discussion of, of people's concerns or anything of that nature. But this is a tool that has for decades been used to um, lock certain people out of communities. And frankly, whether intentional or not, obviously sometimes intentional, um, often sometimes not, um, it has had that impact regardless of the intention. So um, that's one of the reasons why I think being as permissive as we possibly can makes sense. We, um, so I, I support option A. I support uh, working uh, with the Norman Ridge neighborhood um, on their concerns and, and looking comprehensively at the environment, rental, um, other things like that, as well as the RS1 and, and whether or not those locations make sense um, for this. So um, that's my summary. Thank you, Councilmember Nelson. 
Councilmember Member Mua. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for having this conversation with us. Um, you can check my ribs because my wife has been elbowing, elbowing me at night because this has kept me up at night. Uh, it's not an easy decision. If it was, this would have been decided back in January before I was on council. Um, sometimes I wish it was. <clears throat> but it isn't an, an easy decision. It's very difficult and it has a lot of emotion and feeling behind it. But when I take a broad look at it, this country, the state, this city has not done enough to provide housing where people want to live. There's land everywhere. You go to outstate Minnesota, there's land to build a house. But people don't want to live there. They want to live here. And so to stay, take a step forward, to help provide that, to give property owners their rights to do what they want with their property that they worked hard their whole life for, to cash in and retire and do some of what you want to do, that's what this is going to help us do. And at this point, with where we're at with housing, it doesn't matter if it's affordable or not, any housing is good housing. Ten people will get their houses. And more than that, if you look at my family, I want to move to a newer house. I have new, new kids. My house is small. My 72 Rambler is too small for us. And when I look at the housing stock in Bloomington, we're very tempted to move because we just don't have the housing stock that supports the type of lifestyle that we want to live with the kids that we have. And so at this point, any housing is good housing to me. It helps residents, whether it's small, uh, a small amount or, or not. Um, but it's a step in the right direction. That's what uh, I am supportive of option A. Councilmember Kern, you want to bring us home? Thank you, Mayor. Um, so obviously I can count noses um, and see that the, the, it seems like there's the votes to, to pass this. Um, you know, my position has not really changed much. I, I feel most comfortable moving forward with um, option B. I feel like in that proposal there were significant cost savings um, based on the changes. Um, and then, I mean, I think Council Member D'Alessandro put it very nicely. I think that there is so much opportunity in front of us right now that we haven't been leveraging. And I don't think that this change is actually going to do very much for affordability. And if anything, I think it's going to increase the costs. Um, if you look at the price per square foot of land and what land will, could be sold at, like with a mid-century rambler versus split into two and then houses built on them and resold, like the cost of land per square foot increases, right? And so um, I just, I have some, I, going into these conversations, my primary goal personally was to make sure that we're doing things to increase access, like affordable housing options for people. And I'm just not convinced that option A gets us there. And if you talk to anybody across Bloomington, east, west, low income, high income, black, white, if you ask them what their favorite, their, the best part about living in Bloomington is, they tell you it's the green space, the parks, the big lots. People move to Bloomington, even if they're in apartments, right? Like they just like having a little bit more space. And so um, I just think that I'm just, I'm not there with A. And so I'm not going to be voting in support. Um, and I absolutely am supportive with moving forward with looking at more environmental protection um, uh, things that we can put into our residential zones uh, to make sure that uh, we're doing everything we can to protect the environment. I also think we need to take a much stronger look at the commercial areas too, right? We've talked about that in the past too. Um, and so uh, I won't go, I won't go on and on because I've, I feel like we've, I think we've, we've had enough conversation um, and, and we can see where things are falling. So uh, so I'll wrap it up there. Thank you, council member. Thank you all for your comments and, and your thoughtful discussion on this over the past five months, however long we've been talking about this. Council, we've got a motion on the table for option A, which is uh, to adopt an ordinance amending chapters 19, 21, and 22 of the city code modifying requirements for single family residential and two family residential lots and dwellings related to definitions, lot size and width, approval processes, setback requirements, parking and garage requirements, platting, and other related standards. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nay. Motion carries 5-2 with D'Alessandro and Carter voting no. 
Uh, Councilmember Lohman, I believe you made the motion, and we need a motion now for summary publication. Yeah, we need five on this one here. Let's see here. Um, in this case, I move to adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of the single and two family residential ordinance. Seconds. Motion by Councilmember um, Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua for summary publication. No further council discussion. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. And we need uh, a motion regarding the comprehensive plan. Councilmember Lohman. We're all moving this case to adopt a resolution approving a comprehensive plan text amendment modifying the, the description and density ranges of the low density residential and medium density residential guide plan designations. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Mua regarding the uh, resolution regarding the comprehensive plan text amendments. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries 6-1 with Councilmember Council Carter voting uh, in opposition. And uh, we also have been asked by staff, and I think I heard pretty close to unanimity uh, among the council, to direct staff to draft potential future code amendments on environmental standards and on the RS1 district. Knowing that the planning staff already has their 2023 work plan in place, I think I would push this off until their 2024 uh, work plan schedule and um, have them put that into that work plan then because I'd, I would hate to take them off of their game because I know they've got a lot of work going on and a variety of things that could affect us in a lot of different ways. Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Lohman. So, Mayor, um, you know, with that being said, um, uh, I don't... I don't I know we've got a number of things that are, that are out there, um, and I'm not sure exactly when we're going to have this this stuff. Uh, you know what we just passed tonight, and when it exactly goes into um, into effect. But I wonder if it makes some sense uh, uh, to. I, I believe the environmental piece might take a much longer period of time, but that RS1 discussion um, that may have more of an impact uh, on these neighborhoods. And I wonder if it makes some sense to to move that part of the discussion. Uh, even if it's preliminary parts of it up uh, into this year, if that's possible. Well, then, as I said, my my preference would be to, to ask them to take this on in 2024 to not disrupt their 2023 work plan. So that, that's my thought on it. I appreciate your input, Council Member. Council Member D'Alessandro? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as Council Member Lohman. I, I don't know what is what would be put off in the 2023 work plan to to make room for this they didn't bring that information to the table tonight so i don't feel confident i can make a decision but sooner rather than later for me is important um, um i uh i was hoping that we would have that information as it is and um we don't so the sooner we can get it that would be preferable other council thoughts on this Councilmember Nelson. Thanks, Mayor. I'd just like to add a third to that. It would be nice to know what might get moved before finalizing that decision. All right. Um, so it, maybe we maybe we hold off on the uh, the direction to staff on this. Uh, we could get something back. I just see a, a message here from Mr. Verbrugge, something back in June as to what the options would be, what would fall off the, the work plan, and what would would be replaced if this was the case. So is, if everybody's comfortable holding off this decision until we have a little bit more information until June. Uh, Mr. Mayor, are we talking about like early June or are we talking about July, essentially? <laughs> oh, we're, we're talking June, Council Member. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, again, a lot, a lot on our plate sometime between now and, say, I don't know, June 21st. So it, it, it might be an issue. I don't know. Council Member Lohman? Yeah, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I would prefer to see it that first meeting uh, in June. And I think what I'm looking for is, you know, we've got a, you know, a, a, a work plan for planning. Uh, to bring that forward so we can have a look at that um, uh, and see if there's something that makes sense that we could, you know, maybe maybe push out so we could get this in there. So that, that'd be... The, the note that I just got is probably the 5th. So, yeah. yeah, earlier in June. All right, awesome. Yes. All right, so we're comfortable holding off that decision until June, June 5th? All right. Staff, is there anything else we need to finalize here before we, as we move forward? Very good. Um, Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanted to just verify for my own self, this is both the environmental piece and the RS1. It's both items, right? Mr. Johnson? 
Uh, Mayor Bussey, Councilmember Nelson, they certainly can be split uh, in terms of the timing and some of that. Perhaps that's part of the discussion uh, in June. If you think of the capacity it takes, it's you know uh, a third or a half the capacity for one versus the other. One probably involves more analysis than the other potentially. Um, uh, but the other point I was going to make, um, it eluded me. So never mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never minding. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. I remembered. Sorry, oh, Mayor Bussey. Uh, if uh, I, I think that again, this is kind of similar to the May first discussion around the straw poll or head counting. But I think what we were, uh, what I was directed uh, by the city attorney is that it would be good to get a formal motion directing staff to work on those things. But maybe that can be delayed until June fifth. I don't know. I, I think it makes work makes sense to hold off yeah. the motion until we Great. have a, a better understanding of what we're making the motion on. And, and amend the work plan, perhaps, mm -hmm. correct. So we're comfortable with that? Again, thank you, Council, for the discussion on this. Thanks for the work that went into it. Staff, thank you. I know it's uh, it's been a long road. And neighbors, thank you all for, as I said, your, your thoughtful discussion, the, uh, the, the respectful disagreements and arguments that we had, and uh, your bringing information forward. It, it's appreciated. And uh, it's, it's the way it works sometimes is that... Uh, the decisions that you hope are going to be made are not made. And uh, But again, thank you for your participation and, and the way that you brought everything forward. It's greatly appreciated. So thanks much. We will move on in our agenda to item 4.4, which is our fourth and final public hearing, and this regarding the comprehensive plan amendment in response to a 2022 system statement issued by the Metropolitan Council. And we have us with us this evening... Mr. Ramler Olson from our planning department. Good evening, welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Where's everyone going? Okay, great. Uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, the proposal before you tonight is a comprehensive plan amendment that was crafted to respond to a 2022 system statement issued by the Metropolitan Council last September. So stated differently, it's just to incorporate revisions noted in a 2022 system statement, again, issued by Metropolitan Council. Those revisions are concentrated in sections four and seven of the comprehensive plan. Um, trans the transportation and community facilities, respectively. Um, a little bit of the background. Um, we don't have to go through all of this, but the system statement or the system plan basically deals with a um, an area of focus, such as land use, transportation, uh, sewer, water infrastructure, and those are long range comprehensive plans. Um, the system statement, it's specific to each community within the metropolitan area, it summarizes changes um, from system plan updates. The, the two that are, um, that are uh, the impetus for the comprehensive plan amendment before you tonight, or the proposal, uh, proposed comprehensive plan amendment, uh, those were it, um, completed in 2020. And uh, those system statements were issued in uh, just last year. And uh, these system statements are prepared by Med Council to help metro area communities understand the updates to the system plans and um, as they're statutorily obligated um, to revise their comp plan or to review and see if there are any revisions necessary. And um, uh, staff, of course, identified revisions or, um, and that forms the basis of the uh, comprehensive plan amendment that you see before you tonight. And um, I suppose it's it's good to emphasize that this is distinct from the decennial comprehensive planning process um, that was adopted just recently. This is only looking specifically at those items that are noted in the system statement. So we're not going out of our way looking at other issues that are, that nonetheless, I mean, they may be out of date um, between now and when the concert, uh, comprehensive plan was adopted. So we're just focusing specifically on those issues that were highlighted in the system statement. Um, this is the timeline uh, briefly summarized. Those system plans were adopted in 2015. As I said, 2020, they were updated, the uh, transportation and community facilities. Um, we received our, our system statement last year, and 
we have nine months to review and revise our comprehensive plan. And that puts us at the end of June. So it has to be approved and then submitted to the Met Council for review. Um, a summary of the updates that are being proposed by staff is just changing the project status of those projects that were highlighted in the in the the, the system uh, statement, uh, uh, mainly concentrated within uh, the transportation uh, policy plan. Um, we also did some map updates to reflect the latest system statement and to bring them up to date with uh, Med Council system maps. Uh, we updated some fun uh, funding scenarios uh, for specific transportation projects. Um, we can get into uh, detail on that if you if you prefer, but nonetheless, this is just to reflect what's in those system with what's in the system statement and those system plans. Um, we also did some minor updates to functional classification of specific road segments that our uh, public works highlighted. Uh, those were uh, updates to section four for section seven it's mainly concentrated on one particular map so we just added um new symbology uh per the request of um the uh, three rivers park district so we added the um, cp regional trail on the west side of the city going along the the um, west side of uh, highland park um, there were some other corridors that were updated it's just to bring them uh, our map up to date with what the met council has and what the uh, three rivers park district has has adopted we sent out um, a form to adjacent uh, jurisdictions to well uh, affected jurisdictions uh, sorry i should say that um, those in, uh, to, to invite commentary on the proposed comprehensive plan amendment those jurisdictions include cities, uh, school districts, uh, regional state agencies, watershed districts. Um, we've only received seven responses. I believe they have until tomorrow, actually. Um, so March, uh, May 23rd to uh, send in those responses. So um, we've only received seven and two of those seven responses um, were from the Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District, basically letting them know that uh, whatever however these uh system or our, our, our comprehensive plan butts up against uh their um their policies and goals and plans um they'll need to review anything that is directly impacted by our comprehensive plan amendment and then uh there was some comments submitted by three rivers park district just asking us to update some maps according to some of the uh plans that they've adopted since the adoption of uh, the Bloomington Comprehensive Plan. Um, otherwise, yeah, we haven't received any uh, public comments either regarding the Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Um, just to briefly update what happened um, on April 27th, that plenty, uh, public hearing at that Planning Commission meeting, there was unanimous support. Uh, there, there were two absences, but nonetheless, there was unanimous, uh, unanimous support for the Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Um, the Planning Commission uh, and this was also unanimous. There was concern about the comprehensive planning um, amendment process um, as, as it specifically is used to respond to the system statements issued by Met Council. Um, I'm sure you've seen that meeting and got a grasp of what the, um, the thrust of their concerns were. Um, however, we, um, and, and staff did, we, we failed to remind them that this is a statutory obligation. We need to review our comprehensive plan in light of the system statement. So we, we have to do this um, despite misgivings about the process. Um, and uh, the section references there uh, for your review. So this is the recommendation put forth by staff. We do re uh, recommend approval of the comprehensive plan amendment. And uh, that's all I have. Otherwise, I'm here to take questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Ramler Olson. Questions from staff or from council to staff. You explained it perfectly. Well done. Well done. <laughs> if there are no questions from the council, this is a public hearing, and I will open the public hearing on item 4.4. It's regarding the comprehensive plan amendment in response to the 2022 system statement issued by Metropolitan Council. Anyone in the chambers wishing to speak to item 4.4 this evening? 
Mr. Brillert, do we have anyone on the phone? Mayor, we have no one on the phone. Last call for anybody in the chambers. Seeing no one coming forward, Council, and no one on the phone to speak to item 4.4, .4, I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Lohman to close the public hearing on item 4.4. .4. No further Council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council, any discussion on this? Questions, comments, concerns? If not, Council, I will declare action on item 4.4. .4. Uh, Mayor, I'm Council Member Martin. Thank you. Uh, I will move that we adopt a resolution approving a comprehensive plan text amendment to revise the transportation and community facilities elements in accordance with the 22 system statement issued by the Metropolitan Council. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Lohman to adopt the resolution approving the comprehensive plan text amendments as stated. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you much. Thank you. We will move into item five on our agenda, our organizational business. And the first item is uh, item 5.1. It's the consideration of a solid waste rate study. This is something we have talked about and actually requested a couple of different times. So I'm very glad to see that we're, we're gonna be discussing this here. We have a Laura Horner here, our solid waste program coordinator and the chair of our sustainability commission, Deanna White. Welcome, good evening and off we go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, for inviting us here tonight. Um, and thank you for your continued support of our waste reduction efforts uh, from the Sustainability Com uh, Commission and for the rest of the city. Uh, as was stated, my name is Deanna White. I'm the current chair of the Sustainability Commission here in Bloomington, as well as being a Bloomington resident, of course. Uh, and we just want to take a, a minute to discuss, a few minutes to discuss with you a potential solid waste uh, rate study. Uh, we know that you all have expressed um, interest in exploring how solid waste rates could be configured to incentivize waste diversion and reduce rates for residents who may be generating smaller amounts of waste. This interest is shared by the Sustainability Commission as well, and conducting and assisting with the study of our garbage and recycling rates is part of the Commission's work plan for the year. Uh, the Commission Solid Waste Working Group, um, and I'm a member of that working group as well as being chair, has convened a number of times recently with solid waste staff to review some of the information that you're going to hear tonight. Um, this is obviously part of an ongoing effort um, to uh, address waste reduction in the city. And so um, because the details are best left to the hands of the experts, um, I'm going to turn it over to Laura Horner, um, our Solid Waste Program Coordinator, to walk you through the details. Thanks, Deanna. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Laura Horner, the Solid Waste Program Coordinator here for Bloomington. So as Commissioner White shared, we're here tonight to receive direction from Council regarding conducting a solid waste rate study. We've heard from Council Members' interest in exploring our solid weights to accomplish a couple different goals. So one of those goals is to utilize our solid waste rates to help create an incentive for waste diversion through greater use of our existing recycling program and our new organics recycling program, as well as create more opportunities for waste prevention. And this would be just through generating less waste in the first place. Um, over the past two years, we have added additional waste diversion services here in Bloomington, like organics recycling, for residents to reduce their garbage. So with a more comprehensive program now in place, it would be a good time to look at how our rates might help incentivize residents to utilize these services to reduce the amount of garbage that they're putting in their garbage carts. Um, so the second main goal we have heard from council members in, in conducting a rate study would be to help reduce rates for residents on fixed incomes who do not generate a lot of waste in the first place. Uh, we've heard this interest from council in our rate setting process last year. Um, we've also heard this come up more as conversations with residents have taken place regarding our new organics recycling program. So that's just some of the, the things that we think we've heard from council in terms of interest regarding a rate study. So for background, I wanted to share more information about how our rates are currently structured to give you a bit more context in, in a rate study. 
So to begin, our current rate setting process for our garbage is based solely on the rates that the haulers consortium in whom we have a contract with charge the city for each of our garbage cart sizes and the associated solid waste taxes and Hennepin County fees that we collect and pass through. In addition to that, we do have a fixed administrative fee that covers the city's administrative costs for providing our services. So that includes some staffing, customer service, billing, as well as our public education. So for garbage, then residents can choose between a small, medium, or large garbage cart. And the price for those carts increases slightly as the cart volume increases. And this is so because of state law in the Waste Management Act. It requires that garbage rates be set utilizing volume-based pricing. This is also known as pay-as-you-throw pricing. So currently, we already do have some pay-as-you-throw pricing, but the price differential between our small, medium, and large carts is very small. And based on information that I'll share in future slides, it's not likely to really impact residents' behavior in reducing their garbage cart size. So that's how the garbage rates are set. Uh, for recycling and organics recycling, all residents pay the same rate for both of those, those services, and that is regardless of the cart size or how frequently they utilize those services. Uh, we have received more clarification from the state and county recently that the statute that requires residents who recycle cannot pay more than those who do not also includes organics recycling. So we are in line with state statute for charging all residents the same price for organics and re organics recycling and regular recycling, regardless of their um, participation in the program. And a little bit about our process for setting those rates in terms of the timeline, our rates are proposed initially in June for the coming budget year when our budget process starts here in Bloomington. Again, and that's really based on our price with the haulers. And then we hold a budget meeting with council in October where we share our proposed rates. We have then a public hearing in November where residents can comment on our rates. And then our rates are adopted formally with the, um, the adoption of the budget at the end of the year. So that's our current rate setting process. Just to give you a little bit of idea of how we get to our pricing now and kind of the price difference between our garbage cart sizes. So a little bit more information about what we know can motivate climate-friendly behavior change. Um, in March of this year, researchers released one of the most comprehensive reviews up to date of research on what, what works in making people take action on climate and what does not. The study reviewed over 430 primary studies, and the study identified six different types of interventions you might take to modify or change people's behavior regarding climate. These included inter interventions such as appeals, commitments, uh, feedback, education, financial incentives, and social comparisons. So an appeal would be urging people to act more sustainably by targeting their values for certain things. Um, a commitment would be trying to motivate them by making a public commitment or setting a goal. Um, education could be just factual information about the reasons you might do something. Um, financial incentives are fairly straightforward, and this would include programs such as unit pricing programs. Um, to kind of reward financial behaviors. And then a social comparison would be highlighting people's pro-environmental behaviors as something someone else should model, kind of keeping up with the Joneses type of mentality. So based on this study and the research, what they found very clearly is that social comparisons and financial approaches were the most effective tools for helping people to make their, to take more action on climate. So with that information in mind, um, what a pay-as-you-throw rate structure would do is provide that financial incentive to residents to take action and reduce the amount of garbage that they're generating. So this, this would be right on track with what research is showing could help with that. 
Um, kind of with that in mind, staff have had preliminary conversations with uh, Dr. Lisa Skumatz of Skumatz Economic Research Associates. She's one of the leading researchers in this field. She's a consultant for the US EPA and has provided assistance to several cities across the US in the development of pay as you throw programs. And she provided us with more high level scenarios of, about what our rates could look like and gave us a better idea of what a rate study would entail. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you know, in order to determine what that optimal pay-as-you-throw rate structure should look like, how much of a difference we should have between garbage cart sizes, um, staff and the Sustainability Commission do recommend moving forward with a rate study. Um, based on feedback we received from council last year, we did include in our 2023 budget funding for a consultant to conduct a rate study and provide recommendations to us and some scenarios regarding what those rates could look like. So um, we are here tonight to recommend releasing an RFP to get assistance with this work. I'll provide a little bit more of an overview as to what that might entail. Really, the trick to operating a successful program is to find what that sweet spot is in your rates. That is encouraging waste reduction, but it's still generating enough revenue for us to operate our program successfully. Um, we don't want to be encouraging too many people to all move to the small cart, and then we don't have enough revenue to provide to the haulers for payments. So we need to really understand how much behavior change will, we should expect. And we can do that through more of a thorough analysis of actual waste generation. So that would be going out in the fields and lifting up garbage carts <laughs> and taking note of how much material is in the carts over a set period of time so we can really understand what residents are generating. And in addition to that, you know, doing a more high-level analysis of likely waste diversion scenarios and the associated risks with each different scenario is something that the consultant would provide to us. Some of the, um, some of the information we think that we'll learn from this or we could learn is a possible increase in that pay-as-you-throw differential between cart sizes. Currently, we have a 33% price differential between our small and our medium carts. And based on some of our preliminary conversations with Dr. Skumatz, her research suggests that for strong waste diversion, you need between a 50 to 80% price differential between the cart sizes. So our 33% differential right now is not likely large enough to, to impact behavior. So we would anticipate the study might show a few different scenarios um, and waste aversion based on, on the more uh, aggressive scenarios. Um, Dr. Skumatz also shared some information about the benefits of a possible consolidation of services into one base rate that varies based on your garbage cart size. So this revised structure that would incorporate all of our solid waste services into one rate may help residents better understand these services as an integrated system that the city is providing rather than standalone options that residents may or may not wish to participate in. And then lastly, the study might provide us with um, potential pricing for an addition of an every other week garbage cart service level. So this would be a fourth service level that a resident could choose. Um, currently, our contract with the haulers does include pricing and a provision for turning on this every other week garbage service level. So that's something we could do tomorrow. Um, but the price difference in the contract is very minimal for the small or every other week cart, uh, that would be $12.31 versus $13.03 for weekly. So there's not much of a price difference there for residents to utilize that. So we, we think with this study, they could help us understand what a pricing that should be set at if we wanted to turn on that service level as well. So some things to consider as we conduct a rate study um, would be, first off, at different equity impacts. Um, we think that further research is needed to identify 
how this would impact residents across the study. And we would recommend, um, in conjunction with the consultant solid waste rate study, undertaking the racial equity impact assessment to be conducted so we can kind of better understand how modifying our rates might affect residents across the city. We do know that residents with a fixed income who may um, who may already, or residents who might already be zero wasters, they will likely be paying less for services with this. However, larger families with more kids who might be generating more garbage might be adversely affected by paying more for their services. So a rate study would help, this rate study and a racial equity impact assessment could help us better understand um, the cart sizes across the city and how this might affect different communities. Um, the next thing to consider are the financial risks, which I think I touched on a bit earlier, um, but we do know that too aggressive of a pay differential could kind of short the city in revenue if too many residents move to the smaller cart size. However, conducting a rate study and getting more detailed information specific to Bloomington is going to help us reduce the risk associated with this. However, there still is always going to be some financial risk when we choose to modify our rates to some extent rather than simply passing on the same rates that the haulers are charging us. And the third thing to consider is it will it does take slightly more administrative oversight as we begin to modify our rates instead of solely passing through the rates that the garbage haulers charge it will require a little bit of a more in-depth annual rate setting process as we need to, we'll need to make sure that um, the, the modeling is moving forward as we expected for behavior change and revenue coming in. So this slide shows you a proposed timeline. I think the main takeaway here is this rate study um, and if the council were to provide us with direction to move forward and ultimately modify rates after a rate study, this would not affect rates until at the earliest 2025. Um, and that's because this will take us some time to get started. As you know, the budget setting process begins in June. So <laughs> be a little bit too soon to propose rates for, for 2024. So just wanna make sure that people are aware this would be beginning in 2025. It also provides us, we know that this topic will be popular for residents as well. You'll, they'll see it directly on a utility bill changes. So we wanna make sure that we're doing a lot of education and providing good opportunities for community engagement so residents feel like they're understanding what's happening and may have some buy-in in any, in any scenarios here. So we would um, if we receive direction tonight, kind of begin with the RFP process and ultimately conducting a rate study um, later this summer into 20, early 2024 and then come back to council with options before we start the budget process for 2025. So with that, um, I'll leave it up to you guys with for questions or any additional conversation. Our ultimate um, goal would be to recommend directing staff to issue an RFP to conduct that rate study utilizing a pay-as-you-throw model. Thank you much for the presentation and the information. I uh, appreciate it. Council, consideration staff, uh, consideration of your question, uh, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have uh, two questions. Um, when is the uh, contract with the consortium up for a renegotiation, renewal, whatever the word would be. Sure, Council Member Nelson. The consortium contract expires in June of 2026. So we will be coming back to Council probably in the near future to start conversations with Council about direction for moving forward um, with potential negotiations or what we want our future contract to look like. Okay. And then second question I had was when we reduce waste, um, that reduces the cost to the tipping fees and stuff at HERC, but that's all saved by the consortium at this point. Is that, we don't, as a city, get that savings. Is that right? That's, that's correct. We, and I know that's something that the council has been interested in. That's something we kind of tried for in our last negotiations with the haulers was to move to a system where we may consider paying for disposal directly. So currently, we, we don't, it's set into our rates. So um, 
we don't save any money in that scenario. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions, Council? I, I think in, in addition to the pay as you throw model and you know studying that based on what I've heard this council talk about in in the past some other kind of creative possibilities you know we, we've talked about neighbors sharing a can or you know the every other week or you know some ways to to look at this this issue creatively and I understand there's the business model end of things where you got to pay the bills it's got to it's got to cash out but there must be other cities elsewhere who are facing who or who have faced the same thing and have come up with some creative way to try and, and deal with some of the concerns that we hear from, you know, single family households that simply don't generate the waste even to fill a small can. So I, I think, I, I mean, is that possible to throw that into an RFP as well? Uh, or is that just maybe perhaps uh, staff direction to, to study other options and other possibilities from across the country? Mayor, council members, certainly I think that we can bring forward more kind of ideas for how we can reduce waste or is, is it getting at reducing waste or more so the I think it's uh, certainly reducing cost. waste but also the the options for homeowners of how to dispose of their waste sure you know again could they share could could two neighbors share a trash can mm -hmm. or or something along those lines and that's the extent of my you know trash <laughs> reduction creativity at this time of night right now on a Monday but I mean there's got to be other there's got to be other models that are out there somewhere certainly. where um, folks who don't generate the trash uh, there, there are options for them certainly and that's something we can look at as as well as in a in a, our future contracts there is this would be a good opportunity for us to start thinking creatively about mm -hmm. other things we might like to see no I was just gonna say that Behind all of our efforts to reduce waste, we try to think about how that impacts the market and packaging and all of the upstream upstream solutions that are ultimately necessary uh, to re to significantly reduce garbage, not just in Bloomington, but uh, you know across the country. And so we're we're constantly looking for new and creative ways to do it, and and would welcome any thoughts you all have. But we'll also uh, do a little, little more research on our own as well. So. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Loman. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, nice to see you both. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the other um, ideas that I had uh, talked with some neighbors about was um, when they're on a cul-de-sac, can they have a kind of a collection area at the end of the cul-de-sac? People don't have a problem moving things down, but the amount of time it takes to go around a cul-de-sac and pick up all the trash and everything versus having a maybe a larger set up for a cul-de-sac. I don't know how many of those we have in this uh, city, but we seem to have a lot of them. Um, so, you know, another, that's another idea for sharing uh, collection. Um, my understanding from some folks is that, you know, when they get constrained in a cul-de-sac area like that, every person having to have four cans, it gets a little tedious. But if they could divide that, you know, people who might not be participating in organics recycling today might choose to do that if there was a place at the end of the block that they could go to. So I think including um, those kinds of things um, and, and then thinking about that for the purposes of the haulers as well, because the less stops they make, the more efficient they can be and that kind of thing. Um, so that was one idea that I had. I, I'm a big fan. I, I know that there are con, you know concerns uh, about larger, larger, um, larger, um, cart sizes, you know, um, affecting larger family sizes, uh, and, and, and us not being too punitive simply because a person or family decides to be larger. Um, and I, I respect that. I think there's a real, uh, cha challenge though, um, in education associated with families, um, um, meaning that there are, um, there are option, opportunities for us to um, do work with families uh, to understand, uh, you know, how they can reduce their garbage um, accumulation, um, and and why it's important, uh, and and give them incentivize uh, incentives to do that, you know, in multiple languages and in multiple ways. So you know, there's an outreach component to this that I think would be very interesting, and maybe maybe the consultant can look at um, even 
uh, even if it's larger cities, but in m- certain cities where there's a, a, a ton of diversity, you know, even even what might be happening in a place like L.A. or Houston, you know, where we can have a sense for how um, how you communicate to folks who don't have, um, you know, I, I'm a white gal who watched the Native American with the tear on the side of the road in the 70s, right? I know why I don't litter and I know why I'm good with my garbage, but obviously I'm that I'm a privileged person in a white community that was very white for a long time. And people who come to this country don't necessarily have those memories and don't necessarily have those incentives. And that's fine. But so for them to have an understanding about why um, we value it and to help them understand if it could be something that's valuable to them, that there's an, there's a barrier to overcome there that I think is important. And I think it's on us to do that uh, as opposed to just expecting people to like figure it out uh, if you know what I mean. So um, I, I think um, having a clear understanding of how multicultural programs of outreach can affect this um, is a is that social component that you kind of allude to. So it's not just about the finances; it's really about the adoption, um, and I think that's an important component. So yeah, thank you, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Loman. Uh, I'm just going to pick up right where you you left off there, Councilmember Alexander. I I want to second that that piece because I I thought that you know when when I had our first uh, child, we'd go from the small uh, trash can to the next in the medium size, but we were able to, you know, by using the organics and by utilizing some of the other stuff, we're able to get by with just keeping with that, that small uh, one. So let's, let's see what happens when the next one comes along, you know, Mm -hmm. am I going to be made into a liar (laughs) and be forced into the, into the medium one? Um, So I I do, uh, I I really appreciate that, that, that statement. um, Because I think there's a lot of work that can be and should be, you know, as we get ready to do that study, look at, look at that. So appreciate that. Um, Before I move on to the next couple things I wanted to mention, I just wanted to just thank staff uh, for, you know, um, I mean, you guys worked hard on this. You know, I really grinded you guys pretty hard on some questions, <laughs> um, and so I really appreciate um, uh, the work that you that you did uh, to bring this uh, before the council. And just want to let you know how much I, I sincerely appreciate that, and also the other folks that were uh, <laughs> uh, on on the group with us. Um, uh, one piece, um, and I know I brought this up before, but I wanted to just be sure I brought this forward uh, tonight, is the cart sizes. Um, could, you, could you just, you know, ever so briefly talk about, you know, we're kind of locked into those cart sizes that we kind of have right now and that there isn't really those options to bring in? Because uh, I'm like, well, why don't we stick a cart size in between the, <laughs> the medium and the small or the, or the big and the large? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, Mayor Councilmember Lemon, that's a great point. And we, our cart sizes are based on really the standard cart sizes that all haulers provide to communities. Um, and it's kind of also based on the trucks and the arms that they can use. So oftentimes we hear, well, I would never fill a full 30 gallon organics cart. <laughs> and I think we understand that you'd have a lot of food waste if you were filling that every week. But that cart size is based on the the need to actually pick that up with the automated arm. Um, so the, the sizes are really based on the standards in the hauling community that we rely on now. Appreciate that. And I also appreciate uh, Council member, if I, sure. excuse me just one second. I'm going to push back on you just a little bit there. Sure. Because as I watch them pick up my organics, the guy gets out of the truck, opens the lid, reaches in and picks up the, uh, the bag and throws it into the truck. And so I understand what you're saying. I mean, it conceivably is that, but I think more practically, I don't know that that's happening. I don't think they come around with the truck. In my neighborhood, they don't come up and it is an automatic dump. It's, it's a guy reaching into the can, picking it up and throwing it into the back of the truck. So, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> just saying, just saying. I probably now do, but, I, but I do appreciate that. Cause you know, I was pushing on that too, yep. but you know, maybe we can add that into, you know, the, the, the mayor's list yes. of, of things to push on, you know, if we can get that, that piece of it. Um, the, you know, thanks for the time frame piece, because you know, I wanted it to be much quicker. But you know, looking at that, it can't be any quicker. <laughs> I understand that. And then the, just the last piece that I wanted to just mention is, um, and I and I know we really can't do this uh, right now because we want to do this study first. But I do think that you know, you know past um, and even the present chair, we've talked about this idea of looking holistically at solid waste um, and to try to look at that as a full spectrum. 
um, and find a way in which to uh, provide that um, as a whole and to provide that as a, you know, as a solid waste uh, or sustainable solid waste experience that where we could eventually, um, you know, with that goal of the reduction piece, provide additional savings across that kind of piece. That's a little bit bigger than the scope uh, of this, and I know that would slow it down, but I do hope that we will, you know, as a council and as, as a community take uh, that whole piece on eventually. Councilmember Mua. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, I want to echo what Councilmember D'Alessandro um, said about the outreach as well. I would um, say that I would prefer to see a, a Bloom whole Bloomington outreach program because when I drive around my neighborhood, there's only about 30%, 40% of people with organic. So I think there's a broader um, need for education for our residents uh, as a whole. And then additionally, <clears throat> I would love to see some long-term impacts of this. Um, when we talk about the demographics of Bloomington, Bloomington is getting older, but obviously with that comes a natural turnover where we get younger and families come in again. So I would love to see a long-term impact of if this goes and demographics, demographics change, how does that impact um, our, our waste removal system uh, in the future? Also, is there anything else? Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't know if this applies at all, but would there be any consideration of looking at it? I believe there's a private company that takes some things, you know, you can call and have them collect, I forget the name of it. Um, and would that, I mean, that obviously impacts whether it goes into a trash can or goes somewhere else, but it's not, it, it's for fairly specific products. I don't know if you have any idea what I'm talking about. Okay, can you help me out? Say me. Sure, certainly. Um, <laughs> Council Member Nelson, I believe you're potentially referring to Ridwell, yes. which is a, like a, a specialized company, and what they really try to do is pick up items that cannot be put in your carts currently. So it wouldn't um, necessarily impact what residents can put in their recycling and organics recycling carts, but it's another opportunity for specialized recycling of items like plastic bags that you can't put in your regular recycling cart uh, or batteries, um, textiles, and different specialized items. So I'm not sure if that would fall into a, a rate study piece because it is so specialized and it wouldn't necessarily impact what's going in those current carts. But uh, we do know that that's a popular program here in Bloomington, and we do get questions about that from residents from time to time. I, w I would just say that I think some of those items are going into the trash. Um, batteries and stuff. I know my neighbor's garbage caught on fire. so That's no good. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <Wow. laughs> um, so it, uh, I had that question. The other question I had was related to timing of this um, because there is the risk that you noted that, you know, if we – overemphasize the difference we get a lot of people that maybe don't even change their behaviors that much they're just one of those families that for five dollars a month they didn't get a smaller cart they just haven't got around to that all of a sudden they go wait now it's a lot more they get that smaller cart we're not reducing any trash but we're generating less revenue um and taking that risk that you noted so i guess my question is does it make sense to time this to the um hopefully RFP process or whatever process we use uh, with the trash haulers at the end of that term. So we don't, we can eliminate that risk um, and kind of tie this in with them on what, what they're doing. I think that's something that we could consider. I think what we're hoping to get out of the rate study is going to be a, diff a price differential, so more of a percentage differential that we should look at. So for, like for our basket cost of services. So I think that with the new contract, we could still um, apply those same recommendations that we might start in 2025 with this current contract. Um, and then if we receive new pricing for a future contract, we could also then include that in future, in that, in that future pricing, if that makes sense. So I don't, I don't think that there would be too much of a concern of starting that in, within our current contract. I don't know if there's any benefit to waiting for a new contract. Right. It's just something to think about. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, in, in my mind, the, the benefit is you eliminate that risk because then you got those costs lined up uh, in there. Uh, so I had a third. Oh, I was 
the mayor was trying to be creative. So, and I, I think I've asked this before, and it's probably not possible. I remember having a trash hauler uh, many years ago that actually weighed the trash, and there was some kind of program they had. Uh, they, they weighed, I think, the recycling. It was so they were incentivizing, you know, bricks in the bottom of your recycling bin or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it it was interesting, but um, the. I've, I've always wondered, and I think I've asked this before, and I think the answer is no, but I just ask it again, that is there a possibility to just go straight weight-based system? And if you generate a lot less, you pay a lot less. If you generate more, you pay more. And, you know, the cart size is a proxy for that. Could we just measure it directly? Sure. So, Council Member Nelson, currently that sort of technology really isn't being utilized in – in this area um, to be providing the pricing solely based on the, w the weight of the material. Um, kind of the standard is based on cart sizes for pricing. Um, it, may, it might present more difficulties for a city to know how much they need to be paying based on the, how different it would be for each resident. So budgeting, that could become a little bit more complicated as well as you might not have a as good of an understanding of the amount of material that's getting generated. So I think it's a good idea as well, but it's not something that's really being done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so council, the, uh, the slide with the recommendation is actually the language is a bit different than what the official motion sheet has. And uh, I think the official motion sheet is what staff is looking for. So. Unless there's further discussion on this, I would look for a motion to direct staff to initiate a solid waste rate study and issue an, a, re a request for proposal for consulting assistance. So moved. We've got a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We've got a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Mua to, uh, to uh, direct staff to initiate a solid waste rate study and issue a request for proposal for consulting assistance. Councilmember Nelson, question? Uh, no, just a comment. Please. On the motion. So um, I'm going to oppose this, but only because of the timing issue. I think it's a good thing that you're doing. I just think it'd be better to put that timing aligned with that contract um, part of it. So that's just my thought. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Loman. Thank you. You know, and um, I'm not going to oppose it, but I do think there's some merit, uh, given the, the fact that I've been uh, on the solid waste uh, um uh, pardon me, on, on, the, on the other CCC committee. Um, and I hadn't thought about that until you just mentioned that now in terms of putting those things together. Um, I know it would uh, push it out more, but I do see some merit to, to kind of what you're saying. Um, and I just haven't fully thought that through. So I'm going to support this uh, today. But um, d please don't take that as a, you know, I don't, don't disagree with, with what you're saying because I think there's something to that, what you're saying. If I can ask for a Clarification, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't. I don't think the RFP necessarily has anything to do with our implementation plan in the sense that, like, we're going to submit it for an RFP. That's all we're pa passing right now. And once the RFP comes back, um, this tentative plan could change based on the information. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We're not committing to kicking off these rate adjustments in 2025 tonight. By any stretch, no, as far that, as I that, understand. That is correct. Is that correct? Remember, I think all we're looking to do now is initiate the rate study. And yeah. By doing that. Yes, you can go do an RFP. Yeah. Period. Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Well, you want to oppose it. That's cool. But I just wanted you to know you're off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, you could come back and oppose it later. It would be fine. <laughs> we're going to get plenty of choices. Councilmember <laughs> Nelson? Yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, I, I appreciate that, yeah, Councilmember sure. D'Alessandro. Um, and I, I would say that I, I'd still... Uh, oppose it because of the fact that I think the data would be more timely if it was tied in with that process. It would be, instead of a little bit more stale, it would be timely to that decision on there. So, but look, I, my guess is it's going to go down 6-1 and, uh, or go forward 6-1, and I think it's a great thing that you guys are doing to try to reduce waste and manage this. We've got a huge trash problem in this country area, um, Burnsville, you know, <laughs> so... Councilmember D'Alessandro? Yep. Uh, so I apologize, uh, Councilmember Nelson. I thought you were opposing it on the grounds of the timing of implementation, but you're opposing it on the grounds of when to kick off the RFP, and I didn't understand that. So apologies. Duly noted. Um, I, I I just wanted to make a quick comment of thanks. Uh, I Ever since I 
ran for office the first time. I've talked to many, many seniors, especially on fixed income who don't understand how our rates are determined and things like that. Um, they don't, they don't mean to be mad, they, but oftentimes they are because their bill just keeps going up or they just don't understand. And, and I think that this is a, or they just literally have one bag of garbage every other week and they just don't know why they can't put it out every other week or share with their neighbor. And so I love that you're doing this. It's a big part of what I think we can do for benefits um, for, for that population. You know, 40% of, of the city of Bloomington is over the age of 50. Like it is. Um, and so it's important to think about that. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for prioritizing it. Very good. We've got a motion and a second on the table. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 6-1 with Councilmember Nelson in opposition. Thank you much for uh, pulling this together. I like, I like the direction this is going. Curious to see where we're going to end up. So thank, thank you so very much for it. Thank that. you. Thank you very much. Item 5.2 on our organizational business is the 2023 legislative update. And I will tell you folks, as I've sat here, Mr. Sable has been working on it feverishly because it's been changing in about the past, every 15 minutes or so, it, it keeps changing. So he keeps trying to get the most updated information possible from uh, St. Paul. I will turn it over. Mr. Sable, good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. They, uh, the House is still in recess at the call of the Speaker. They are The revisor's office is uh, making sure that all of the bills match and all of the language matches. Uh, our lobbyist says 11 p.m. is the current target for... Uh, end of session. Um, I did want to provide just a little bit of update, and I don't know if City Manager Verbrugge is still on the call, but he may want to weigh in as well. But uh, earlier this year, um, the City Council adopted some legislative priorities. Yeah, and in, in um, no small feat, there were uh, the Bloomington sales tax was the priority item for the City Council. Uh, this was the ability to, to ask for legislative support for a half cent sales tax in the City of Bloomington to fund the Community Health and Wellness Center uh, and Public Health Building for $100 million, uh, renovations to Bloomington Ice Garden for $35 million, and a Nine Mile Creek Corridor Renewal Project for $20 million. Uh, I am Happy to say that that is uh, included in the tax bill and is on its way to the governor, and uh, the governor is fully intending to sign it. So uh, it's exciting uh, opportunity for the city of Bloomington to make some significant investments in things that this community has longed for. And uh, you know, from an environmental standpoint, based kind of on the previous discussions, um, making sure that the Bloomington Ice Garden continues to function uh, for our community is, is a huge one. Uh, and so we will, um, the bill will be passed and signed into law. Uh, the governor's office has three days to sign it once the bill has been submitted to them, uh, to him. So there, it, if the House or Senate delays the submittal, it could extend out the, the signing ceremonies, but we'd expect them to kind of wrap up this week. Uh, so that's a very exciting opportunity for us. And so we will uh, bring forward, uh, we'll work on the back end to make sure that we have the resolutions uh, accepting the, the authorization and then uh, getting into discussions about how to include those items on the ballot initiative as they are. Uh, the second component that was re um, put forward by the City Council was bonding requests and support for both the Community, Health, community Wellness Center. Uh, we requested $10.135 million and then Bloomington Ice Garden um, in kind of a... Um, a horse trading, I'm sure, at the at the Capitol that we weren't involved in. Uh, they, the state legislature did give us authorization for funding for planning and design of both of those uh, projects. So $1.8 million for the Community Health and Wellness Center and $2.272 million for Bloomington Ice Garden. I believe that was the, our original request or estimate was around $3.4 million. So I think we were the subject of a rounding error or they needed to make the math work on there. And so we got an obscure number of 2.272. Um, one of the things I want to mention in the state bonding request is sometimes we support the efforts of others. And so the Bloomington Remembers Veterans Project was submitted for $350,000. Happy to announce that they are going to get that dollar amount. Uh, the gr community group still has some fundraising uh, to go on their end, but I think when you reach the more than 50% threshold, I think lots of other people like to see uh, dollars in, so we were encouraged that they're going to move forward with that. Uh, with, related, with regard to Expo 2027, uh, the city, the Port Authority has sought $15 million in planning services for the host committee. Uh, at the end of the day, the... Um, 
state has authorized $5 million in seed money for that. And so we are developing the necessary agreements. I just want to give you some fair warning that some of the timelines are quick. So this agreement may have to be done by the 30th of this month. So uh, the city attorney's office will be working on some getting some agreements put together uh, very quickly. Uh, with regard to transportation, and I may have to ask Carl Keel to come up here because there's a significant numbers of investments for transportation. So while the I-494 vision project was not uh, fully funded and outlined in the bill, the quarter of commerce dollar that was submitted was more than the $70 million. They just didn't earmark any projects. And so there's more money available, but it's not uh, dedicated. So we will have to do some work on our end for um, advocacy at the, with MnDOT and with our planning team. Um, but so there's significant dollars in transportation. And I also then make note that there is a uh, sizable investments in a metropolitan sales tax to go towards transportation and um, uh, indexed gas, uh, sorry, the gas tax will be indexed to inflation. Uh, so the gas tax will go up, which will provide more dollars for transportation. And so as we unpack these bills, we think we may have more opportunities for grants for funding for our road projects. Uh, with regard to public safety, I, um, we, we talked about some strategic investments uh, in both equipment and technology, but also then on brain health. Those were two efforts that Chief Hodges had identified early on in his tenure here as uh, necessary. And we have uh, our public safety allocation directly from the most recent bill is $3.98 million in one-time funding for public safety-related measures. Now, it's intended to be a balanced split between police and fire, and so I think uh, Chief Seal and Chief Hodges will discuss and negotiate what that might look like. It is not allowed for vehicles, and so um, this really does, it's an opportunity to make a strategic investment, but a one-time investment in a uh, service delivery model, and so um, stay tuned for that. The money will come forward at $3.98 million. Um, and then the economic development, uh, our partners at McGuff had asked for an extension of the five-year TIF at Bloomington Central Station, um, and that provision is in the tax bill, and so we were successful in getting that. Uh, the tax committee chair, who arguably knows more about taxes than anyone in the state of Minnesota, preferred her language being in the bill, and we were more than willing to accommodate that because ultimately the decision will rest with this body and how that plays out. And so from a standpoint of priorities, I think the city of Bloomington came out very, very well. Um, I will say that I uh, the, the bonding bill is always the most complicated politically because it's re required a certain number of votes, which is greater than 50, so it's a 60% it's a majority. And so the, uh, the what happens behind the scenes at the Capitol is very important. And so sometimes you're winners and sometimes you're losers. Um, but as the fourth largest city in the state, I think our uh, influence is growing. And I just make note that the city of Rochester received $19 million in bonding requests and a local option sales tax request. So I think our um, advocacy and message for next year ought to be, we ought to be higher in the bonding bill uh, from this point going forward and, and flex the city's muscle a little bit as the fourth largest city in the state. Um, there are some policy changes that happened, uh, the legalization of marijuana. It is a 317-page bill that I don't think anyone at city staff has read in full. So we are assembling a small team with our uh, with, you know, police and legal and the clerk's office and the licensing folks. And we're also really going to rely on our partners at the League of Minnesota Cities to say, what does this mean for us? Uh, we have until August 1st to figure it out. So we will be back before the city council with some uh, pretty clear policy questions about um, what we're going to do with marijuana. And and we did, we have to work on a name, too. We, somebody said devil's lettuce, and we weren't sure that that was the appropriate title for a working group. But um, don't didn't mean to make light of that, but I thought it was great. Um, the other thing I would I would note is there's a significant investment in local housing dollars that are available um, through a, a sales tax. And uh, in addition to that, then the, earned, the state also approved paid family leave and earned sick and safe leave. And again, um, maybe I'll ask Melissa Mandershide to talk about kind of the working group, but there are side-by-side um, -side bills being, or reviews being done. And so I'll turn it over to you, if that's okay, Mayor. Please. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members, uh, Mike. The there are a handful of cities in Minnesota that have an earned sick and safe leave local ordinance, and many of them got together last week and talked through what the state legislation uh, is like compared to the locals. The, many of the locals are similar, 
the state legislation is similar as well, but there are some very specific differences. Um, talked through many of those differences today uh, internally, and there is a meeting. What day is it? It's coming up. Um, Wednesday. Wednesday um, uh, with Jamie and Mike and some others to talk through some of the uh, decision points that need to be made with regard to how we're going to handle the next steps. The state legislation uh, is effective January 1st of next year, and our local legislation is effective July 1st. So we have been doing a lot of education uh, in the intervening time period since you all adopted it, and so we need to make some decisions about possible next steps, and um, and we will have those, and they will be communicated um, we also, I will add, in working with those communities that also have local ordinances, have talked to them about coordinating our edits uh, and our amendments, if there are some, such that we are consistent across jurisdictions. Uh, many of us share boundaries, and we want to make it as easy as possible for businesses to comply. Anything else to add? Well, um, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I think the only other thing I would add is that the State Department of Economic Development put in a significant, uh, nearly half a billion dollars or more of investment in um, the CHIPS Act and Minnesota Forward and making sure that there are smart investments uh, in semiconductor technology and, and Bloomington can, would, will like, Bloomington businesses will likely benefit from that uh, provision in the bill. and. Uh, I see City Manager Verbrugge's head popped up on the screen, and so I'm I'm presuming he may want to weigh in on all of the things that I missed. Good evening, Mr. Verbrugge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Good evening. I, uh, I I don't think that Mike missed much of anything, so just a couple of additional items. Uh, the, the South Metro Public Safety Training Center, which is a joint operation, it's a Joint Powers Organization of the City of Bloomington, Edina, Eden Prairie, and the Metropolitan Airports Commission uh, also received a million dollars in the bonding bill that is going towards capital improvement there uh, to, to enhance that facility for public safety training purposes. So we were uh, very pleased to see that. Uh, and the other, uh, the other thing I'd say is that, uh, as has been remarked upon by many people, this has been the um, most consequential session in recent memory or even not recent memory. Uh, however, however folks feel about that, what it means is there's an awful lot that we are going to have to absorb. And so Mike referenced uh, working with our friends at the League of Minnesota Cities and also at Metro Cities. Uh, they will be providing us uh, significant summary information for all of the bills that have asked relative to local government. And uh, we may have a series of uh, issues that we'll be bringing back to update council on, depending on uh, what we learn over the next month or two. Uh, but it is a significant amount of work that has happened. And uh, we've, we've got a fair amount of work going forward just to study that. And uh, not just from a policy perspective, but uh, I've already heard from a couple of council members who are seeing the, the bills that are passing and uh, hoping there is opportunity to be pursued for some of those council strategic uh, goals. And we'll be looking at uh, whether that's a possibility as well. So much more to come on the legislative stuff. I do want to uh, say thank you to all of our staff who have worked really hard uh, tracking issues on, on the legislative front and uh, to Mike for coordinating on staff. And I want to acknowledge the work of our, our lobbying team uh, that uh, had, a, had a really good session representing the residents and businesses and visitors in Bloomington. I think that uh, you know, we, have, we have a lot to be uh, uh, proud of in terms of how our delegation uh, advocated for us and uh, the results that we've seen in this session. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Couldn't agree more, especially uh, with uh, the need to thank our legislative delegation who did outstanding work this session supporting Bloomington um, and, and bringing Bloomington issues forward. So we have to remember to be thanking our delegation as often as we can when we see them. 
uh, and also agree completely with your comments that this was the as it happens type report, and we've got a lot more to learn about this as we go. And so uh, I expect that over the next few weeks we're going to be hearing more and more about these bills that have passed, their impact on Bloomington, and what the next steps are going to be in terms of programming, all the funding that's coming in, what we have to do to prepare for it, and make the most out of the opportunities that we have here. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question, and maybe Mr. Verbrugge knows if uh, if Mr. Sable doesn't know. Um, <clears throat> I know that there was a group of folks working hard to increase the funding for the Active Transportation Fund. Do we know if that happened, and if so, by what amount? Mr. Sable. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, I don't know the answer to that question in the moment, but if you give me about 40 seconds, I can do my best. Thank you. That, 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 that's, a, me, that's a way for me to plug that we should go get some of that. You see that, how, how that worked? I see that. Yeah, okay. Just, I was out of that. Thanks. Just add it to the pile, it sounds like. Thank you. Council, any additional questions? Well, I think it was... Uh, yes, it certainly was a consequential session, and I think we've got a lot to be happy about here in Bloomington and, and still more work to do, but I think we're in, in good shape in a lot of different ways, a lot of different ways. It took you less than 40 seconds, Mr. Sable. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, I've gotten good at the find all on the, uh, or on the search function. Uh, in the transportation bill, there's $40 million in fiscal year 2024 for matches to federal aid related to transit and active transportation projects, $40 million. Thank you. I don't know if that's exactly the thing I'm thinking of, but that sounds like a good number. <laughs> it's not a bad number, right? No, million is I not mean, a bad number. There, there, what I'm saying, Mr. Mayor, is that there is an actual active transportation fund that needs to be explicitly funded, and that didn't sound like it oh. was an explicit funding line item for that fund. That's okay. It, maybe it will be. Mr. Sable. Thanks. $19.5 million in transfer from the general fund to the active transportation account under Minnesota statute 174.38. That's the number. That's, the number. That's great. That's an increase in almost $10 million, which is great. Good. Well, good. Well, thank you, Mr. Sable. Thank you, Mr. Brugge. Anything else to add? No. No? Very good. And we will move to our final... Item of the evening, as it typically is, item uh, 5.3 is our City Council Policy and Issue Update. Uh, first item, of course, is our recap of our listening session. And the listening session, we did not have anybody stop by tonight for our listening session. So we didn't have anybody and we didn't have a listening session. Well, we did have a listening session. We didn't have anyone stop by for the listening session. So uh, nothing to report there. Uh, Mr. Verrugge, anything from City Manager's standpoint? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to uh, notify the council that we had uh, late breaking uh, uh, travel uh, for the mayor coming up on May 31st, June 1st. We didn't have the details of the costs associated with it to put on the agenda tonight. Uh, so following our travel policy that we updated related to council travel, uh, city manager uh, approves the travel, notifies the council, and then we will bring action at the June 5th meeting uh, to ratify the travel. The purpose is to attend a, uh, an event that is being coordinated by the State Department uh, and also is, so it's focused on um, uh, a little bit on Expo and, and then also on infrastructure improvements. So the mayor will be attending uh, that meeting next week. I will send a follow-up communication to council with the estimated costs once we have that uh, summarized. Council, any questions on that? Very good. Anything else, Mr. Verrugge? No? All right. Uh, before I turn it over to the council, the one thing that I want to add, uh, we all had a busy Saturday. or uh, I know we all did. It was a beautiful Saturday. But between the Public Works open house, the police department open house and everything else going on in your private lives and everything else. Uh, it was a very busy Saturday. One thing that I had the uh, privilege of doing was uh, being uh, in attendance at the St. Luke's 100th anniversary celebration right across the street here from uh, City Hall. And it was just, it was a wonderful celebration. And it's hard to believe that there was a church founded in 1923 when this was known as Oxborough, not Bloomington, but Oxborough. 
and the descendants of some of the original seven families who founded that church are still in Bloomington. So uh, congratulations to St. Luke's for 100 years, and thanks much for the invitation to be part of it. It was a lot of fun. Thanks much. Council, anything to add this evening? Council Member D'Alessandro? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at the risk of, of uh, um, well, that's not an analogy I'm going to even come close to saying. I apologize. Um, I would like uh, for Council to consider, as we move forward here, knowing now that many of our strategic priorities, um, assuming obviously voting in November will be covered our public health building that's desperately in need of an upgrade in the big and some great investment in natural resources. I would like to once again can implore this uh, body to consider uh, transferring some strategic priorities fund to help our animal control facility. I, I, not a week goes by that I don't hear from residents who are very unhappy that um, we have um, basically um, a 50-year-old facility that doesn't even include the ability for the animals that are in our care to be in light during the day unless it's artificial because we turn the lights on. So anything we can choose to do, um, you know, maybe we could get a small, medium, large proposal, whatever it is. I, I just don't think we can get the city to take action until we as a body decide that that's what we want to do. So I'm pitching it out there and hoping that you all will agree that that's important. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, I am absolutely, I, I would be, be interested in hearing more from staff on kind of what the options could be, um, whether it's kind of like yeah, option one is minimal investment to improve the conditions. And option two is, you know, putting in windows or whatever. You know, like, um, I'm absolutely open to considering those options from city staff. Um, and I would be curious, too, just, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of the buildings, but, you know, is there a, a different location that would be an option, too? Um, and so, yeah. Councilmember Lohman? Let me jump in on that one, too. Um, I would be very inter interested in us having that, that conversation. Um, and also, I'd like to add to an option of maybe it makes some sense uh, for us to partner with one of our other uh, neighboring communities uh, to see if we can't uh, um, you know, get a, a better uh, experience uh, for our animals. Um, you know, we, we've done that with our public health. Um, you know, we concentrate on that. Maybe it makes some sense for us to let another community take that one that has got a better uh, structure and setup and, and let us kind of move that on. So that's, I'd be very interested in having that conversation. So I'm glad you two uh, brought that forward. And um, uh, I also want to uh, uh, thank my colleagues here, um, both Councilman Carter and Councilman D'Alessandro and also the mayor on, on the hard work that you're doing with the Veterans Memorial uh, piece. I'm really excited about seeing that uh, move forward. I'm hoping to, to be there that day when, when we get that thing up in, in front here, uh, Mayor, as you mentioned. Uh, um, you know, at, at the outset of the, the meeting. And there's just one last thing I wanted to throw out as, a, as an idea. I'm not really looking for a uh, comment necessarily today, but, you know, um, uh, given our, our meeting today, and you know, we've had a lot of conversations about, you know, residential zones, and, um, you know, I'm trying to uh, be more hip and with it. Uh, as my wife says, if you say that, you're not hip and with it. Um, <laughs> um, I was watching a, you know, a show um, about uh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, and in Pittsburgh, they literally, uh, in some areas of the city, they'll have places where they'll take their garages and turn them into bars. And I'm not saying that across the city of Bloomington. I'm not suggesting that at all. But it got me into thinking about some of this, some of these ideas about, you know, there's some of uh, uh, fellow council members who are a little more uh, um, open to this idea of Airbnbs. And I kind of started thinking, well, maybe there's a way that it makes some sense to maybe look at another zone that maybe it might include some of those things. Uh, uh, I, as a council member, am very concerned about um, ADA with Airbnb and, and about what that can do uh, to uh, impact um, residential affordability. Um, but I just I wanted to just throw that out there because I think we need to have those conversations as we talk about um, you know how do we you know make this a remarkable uh, community. Um, yeah, it, it's worth challenging some of those those belief systems that uh, even I have uh, to try to figure out a way if there's a way to get a compromise and, and make some things work and make some exciting things happen in the city. So I just wanted to throw that out um, as something I'm thinking about and trying to figure out how to be more hip and with it. So. 
Others? Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think it would be an interesting conversation um, to to talk more about the Airbnbs. I think actually just coming out of this conversation around the R1 zoning, I am more uh, worried about the amount of single family homes that we have that are affordable for people to buy and to live in. And so if people were to be transitioning, buying homes and transitioning those to Airbnbs, like what does that do to the availability of housing options in our community? And so um, that would be a, con but so it, to me, it's, it, it means it would be an interesting conversation to have at the council because my perspective has changed over the ca past couple of years. Councilmember D'Alessandro, we're going around again. This is great. Well, no, just a com comment, if I may, Wait, comment please. on Councilmember Lowen's point. Um, I, if, if that was a question, um, I do know that just because I did the looking up myself, um, that the short-term rental Airbnb thing is one of the 2023 Planning Commission work plan items that we might be kicking out of here if we're going to try to do this other stuff. So just be mindful of that, first off. More to the point, though, I think owner-occupied owner Airbnbs is a smart idea, and I would agree with Councilmember Carter that um, we wouldn't necessarily want to see more rental units um, happen. I think that actually has clear de detrimental value in neighborhoods. Um, but I think um, I've spoken to a couple of residents who have, um, you know, their entire finished basement with an extra – uh, you know, because it used to be a group home or it used to be a mother-in-law or whatever, and they can't rent it today and they would like to. So I think I think there's opportunities for us to look at owner-occupied short-term rentals as a compromise spot uh, on that front. Um, but I, I do want to just caution that we might have just asked for all the things as opposed to making harsh decisions about what gets booted on the work plan. So thank you. Appreciate that. Council, anything else? Well, to get to four, I will say, yeah, let's take a look at the uh, the uh, animal shelter. I won't commit to saying we should build the Tajma Animal Shelter Hall, but uh, I, I think we could at least look at options and figure out if there might be other ways to, to do that. Um, uh, again, fitting it into our busy staff work plan and, and our tight budget constraints, but at least it's at least worth time to look at, I think. So You missed an opportunity there, Mr. Mayor, to say Taj Meow Hall. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> Just letting you know. With that, we are done with our agenda, clearly. <laughs> Council, I would look for a motion to approve, uh, to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. <laughs> Meow. Opposed. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you much, Council, for your discussion this evening. Thanks again uh, to the staff for the great work that you've uh, done on a lot of different issues, and, and thanks to the the, the members of the community who uh, put in a lot of time, I know, on an important issue to them, and I appreciate the work that they did. So thank you to everyone. Have a great night. <laughs>